evening, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting of the Vermont Development Review Board to order. My name is Daniel Richardson. I serve as the chair of this board. The other members from my right are Rob Goodwin, Meredith Crandall Staff, Ryan Kane, Tom Kester, Claire Rock. Okay, the first uh, item of business is approval of the agenda. Uh, we have three items of business. They're all uh, the same applicant and the same project but different phases. Does anyone have any additions to the agenda or any further comment? Otherwise, I'll entertain the motion to approve the agenda. I'll move we approve the agenda as drafted. Motion by Ryan. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Second by Rob. All those in favor of the agenda as printed, please raise your right hand. We have an agenda. Uh, there are no comments from the chair tonight, although uh, I do want to give a road map uh, as we enter our first uh, application in describing how we're going to proceed tonight and what looks to be likely um, another hearing night. Uh, and explain in part, uh, we're a little bit understaffed on the board tonight because of uh, illnesses and such. So I'll save my comments for chair at that point. Uh, we have one approval, one minutes that we can approve, and that would be the October 1st minutes and the eligible members to approve those minutes are myself, Tom, Brian, Rob, and Claire. So all five of us can vote on said October 1st minutes. Any additions or other corrections? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes for October 1st. So moved. Motion by Tom. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ryan. All those in favor of the minutes from October 1st as printed, please raise your right hand. All right, those have been accepted and adopted. So our first item of business is 100 State Street, final plan review for the two lot subdivision. So I want to take this in two steps before the applicant uh, approves. So I'm going to give sort of an overview uh, of where the board process is likely to go tonight and the next meeting. Uh, and then uh, Meredith is going to give uh, our understanding as sort of the legal process of each silo. Uh, but I want to start off by saying the board understands that there are three applications that are interrelated. Uh, it's going to be difficult to approve one part of this without the other parts. So we have tonight uh, five out of our normal seven board members here. We've asked those who are not here, who are not here because of illness or conflict, I mean, um, uh, other appointment conflicting, as opposed to those who recuse themselves uh, to review the minutes uh, and, the, and the video that's generated from tonight's meeting so they can participate in the next meeting, which is allowed, um, where we'll have consideration. So the board does not anticipate voting on any of the three projects for approval tonight. Uh, or closing the evidence. And I say that at the beginning now um, because I want both the applicant and any parties that are here um, as interested parties, either in support or opposition, to understand that we're not shutting anything down tonight. This is just the first in, in a, at least two meetings that I think is going to be necessary to review all three silos of the project. Now that said, I think the best way to proceed, and what Meredith is going to outline, is to keep each project separate in our review so that we're not mixing the site plan with the subdivision. And so we're going to try and keep those separate. So that sometimes I may act like a traffic cop trying to keep people on task and focused on the specific, but I don't see us coming to either a close of the evidence or to a final vote on any of these three applications. Um, given that they're all fairly interrelated. So, Meredith, if you want to give um, sort of a legal overview, you can pick up where I left off. Yes. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, so, tonight we have three different applications. We have the subdivision application, which is the city's the applicant, um, and they're requesting to subdivide a piece of land that is currently owned by the Capital Plaza Corporation. That subdivision is is going to is the first step in transferring that land to the city for the city to then build the garage. With that subdivision, 
if we were to approve that subdivision without then amending the hotel site plan, then we'd be violating the hotel site plan, the prior approval for the hotel. So the second application is actually by Capital Plaza Corporation to amend their previous approval for the hotel and garage package to pull off the garage and change the garage and put the parking needed for the hotel to off-site parking. You can't have off-site parking unless you have a place to put the cars. So we have the third application, which is the city requesting major site plan approval for the garage. You really, unless there's a condition of approval on one of these that the other, other permits also get approved, none of them work. So chances are we're going to try and approve them all at the same time. But so that's the, the big picture overview. So if we can keep as much as possible subdivision discussion to the things that are outlined in the subdivision staff report and move on from there similar with the other two that would be great for members of the audience who did not get staff reports which have been posted on the website along with the um, agenda for this meeting there are copies of the full package that the DRB members got up on the table and then next to that, there are a couple of supplements that were provided after that package was sent out um, on Friday, which include the third staff report for the garage site plan <coughs> and uh, Department of Public Works memo analyzing the traffic impact study. So those things are up there if people want copies. So the first applicant is 100, st st uh, 100 State Street. It's the final plan review of the two lot subdivision. Um, Greg, if uh, you'll just state your name for the record as well as whoever else is testifying on that, and then we'll swear everyone in. Sure. Um, my name is Gregory Rabideau from Rabideau Architects, and with me this evening is uh, David Marshall from Civil Engineering Associates of South Burlington. Uh, also, Corey. Mac of Resource Systems Group, who is here to answer questions about traffic at some point this evening, and uh, James Finley Shuris, who's a part of our landscape architecture team. Okay, so if the four of you will uh, raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under pains and penalties of perjury? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. I just ask that you pull the microphone out from the piece of paper. Oh, sorry. <laughs> About the time we get this approved, I'll learn that. But <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, your show. Thank you. Um, the subdivision part of this is really, it's really Dave's bailiwick, so I'm going to hand it right over to him. Um, but the, 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 broad, uh, the broad elements of the, of the subdivision are to uh, uh, cab off about a half acre lot from the existing Capital Plaza Corporation lands uh, that will be the uh, city's part of the city's land for the uh, development of the parking garage and there is a, a series of access easements but uh, I'm going to let Dave essentially explain the plan if I can. Um, very good again Dave Marshall from Civil Engineering Associates um, at this point in time our surveyors we have two licensed surveyors that have uh, researched the lands and have put together this particular plat, we will be updating the plan shortly to basically reflect the comments that uh, staff has put together as well as other professional staff within the city to uh, bring uh, the level of detail up to what's necessary ultimately to comply with the uh, regulations. Um, that being the background, this plan that's behind you, uh, that the public is looking at right now, and I will use a pointer at the risk of hopefully not I'm trying to make it larger, but it's pointing any it's very areas big. out. Things that we will be doing is currently the Capitol Plaza property actually extends in the westerly direction. North is straight up on this particular plan, and to orient you, you got the north branch that comes down to the confluence of the Winooski River which flows out in the northwesterly direction. Um, this is the Heaney lot. Uh, this is the uh, parcel that's leased by the city. And uh, this is the church property here for, again, for orientation. And the remaining Capitol Plaza property that extends out in this particular shape here. Um, what the future plan will do is actually show the entire Capitol Plaza uh, parcel and all of the dimensions associated with it 
And in this particular case, as Greg indicated, this application seeks to basically subdivide off approximately one half acre in support of the future parking garage. Uh, in this particular case, uh, staff has identified the need to uh, provide uh, adequate access to this particular parcel, and this is being shown with a series of access easements that ultimately generally are 24 feet wide, uh, ultimately widening out to 36 feet at the, uh, the proposed lot itself. Um, what is not shown on this particular plan are all the easements that are necessary to support the various interests that are going to be associated with this project. Uh, we have uh, various utility easements. We have storm drainage rights that basically will extend from the Capitol Plaza property through this particular property, uh, new lot I should say. Um, so again, we have uh, also water easements that are actually going to be needed as far as cross easements uh, back from Capitol Plaza benefiting the new property itself. Um, utilities, uh, Green Mountain Power we've been working with in regards to dealing with the existing um, high voltage conveyance that runs along the railroad tracks. Currently there's a, uh, a line that basically runs out into the, this particular new parcel that ultimately is going to need to have its access or distribution relocated. <coughs> Um, so we have uh, come up with a plan with Green Mountain Power to uh, provide that particular rerouting not only of what's happening within this particular parcel but also um, as far as providing new services for the capital, remaining Capital Plaza lot. So um, there are going to be, um, it's been very good as far as what's to come together in the past week. Uh, we, we look forward to basically supplementing this plan as a way of um, basically rounding out the submittal process to the board. Uh, this particular plan that Greg has just put up represents um, the proposed parcel and Oops, there sorry. is the proposed parcel. Sorry, um, and uh, what we had just barely seen was uh, some of the components that went on that particular parcel. This is actually primarily the footprint of the garage and uh, this shows uh, the great change between the upper plateau parking lot area and the lower elevation Heaney lot. And uh, just for, again, for orientation purposes, this is the, the church building. And uh, that all being the background, these are the access points. And, and the reason they had specific shapes was primarily because the interest of the city was not to uh, control an access easement that encumbered some of the parking, but basically had free flow access back and forth. Um, from State Street as well as Taylor uh, to basically provide not only a circulation management tool but also access to the proposed lot. Um, yeah, I want to point a few things out. If you nope. Now Greg says Dave has forgot some things so he's no, going to fill in the blanks. Um, I just want to draw attention uh, for the benefit of the public because this came up earlier during the Design Advisory Committee. Um, it, immediately adjacent to the Haney lot is a building generally known as the garage. Um, and I want to point out this property line right here uh, because th all of this, the garage and the parking area behind it, are, are not part of this application. They, uh, they are an abutting property owner. We, we've only identified the lot for, for purposes, for that purpose, and for coordinating utilities and stuff. Um, I think there was some discussion about how there isn't how what is the purpose of this parking lot and isn't it, is this fully designed and everything? These are more site plan issues. But as long as we have the plat up here, I wanted to again for the benefit of the public and the board just point out that the lack of development here is because that's off the project site. <laughs> and a um, couple, uh, couple of other things. There is there is a uh, um, an easement from the uh, Capitol Plaza to the city. For the uh, for the bike path that cuts off a corner of this lot down here, uh, that will have to be incorporated into the design as well. Um, and also to to, uh, to take note of the property line here between Christ Church and and the um, the project site. When we talk about site plan, there's going to be a conversation about why. I think there are, there's some people would like to see a sidewalk right here, um, but I just want to take note of the location of that property line. I'm sorry. 
it, you need to wake up. Um, but uh, I think for now we're focused on the, the, the subdivision plat part of this, and uh, I, I don't have much to add if you don't. I think the, now might be a good time for questions from the board, and then we can fill in the blanks from there. Well, one I, relatively minor point, Greg, you pointed out that, uh, that currently the city has an easement for the bike path in the back corner of what's owned by the Capitol Plaza. Yes. But if the city takes ownership of the lot itself, that easement will essentially be merged with the ownership. Fair enough. Um, I just, I mean, I want to make sure that's what the understanding is. is the bike path will still be there. Right. You know, it's just that it's no longer an easement. It's a, a function of the ownership of the lot. Um, so one question I had, um, and it's on this map, but there's a jog in the right-of-way that comes from Taylor Street. Yep, you just had it on the pointer. Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason for that? That that geometry accommodates the uh, previously approved Hampton Inn. Okay. So uh, the, the the curb cut at Taylor Street essentially comes comes into the site a few yards north of the southerly property boundary. Uh, once we get into the site, though, in order to have enough space for a building, we we have to put that little shift in the road. So we'll see it more when yeah. we get to the hotel site plan. Yeah. I'm curious. Obviously, you know, when you create a, a right of way, sometimes topography requires those kind of jobs. Right. In a place like this, where it may not, um, I'm wondering what what's what's driving that. And so it's essentially the curb bump out from the the existing hotel plans. Yes. The, the, the yes. Uh, likewise, the flaring of the right of way adjacent to. Christ Church's rear parking lot uh, was both because we needed to have at least 30 feet where that intersected the building, but also we're just jogging around the parking spaces, which will remain Capitol Plaza project park property. Uh, there we go. All right. I so guess I, I got to move across. So these, two, these two right of ways are going to be the primary access to yes. this lot? Yes. Um, we're, we're essentially creating a private road uh, coming from Taylor Street through the project site and back out to state. And uh, it'll be that, that uh, shaded surface will be developed, at least in terms of cross-section of pavement to city street standards. It wouldn't necessarily have sidewalks and curbs. And, well, it'll have curbs and sidewalks, but it's it's going to meet city street standards in terms of the construction of the road. I mean, is it going to have uh, line marks to delineate the lanes? Yes. Oh, oh, yeah, of course. But, but it'll, you know, it'll also have the appropriate thickness of asphalt and the appropriate thickness of, of uh, stone and, uh, and any fabrics or anything that are required by your, by your public work standards. And just so I understand, both of these right-of-ways will be dual directional. Yes. Um, and so someone coming in can either come in off of State Street into a garage or from Taylor Street into a garage, but somebody coming out of the garage can either take that left onto Taylor or go straight. Yes. Okay. And regardless of the incoming traffic. I mean, obviously. Right. It's, a, it's at least a 24 foot wide pavement in all, in all cases, so there's more than enough room for two-way traffic. So I'm going to move a little bit off the traffic unless anyone else on the board has. Claire? Yeah, I was actually curious because I felt like I was reading some different terms and clarification on, I understand you're going to have a right of way access, like a legal easement. And then you'd refer to the actual construction of the bed would be up to the city standard. but. Will it be a road? Will it be a public road? What, am I clear on the status of the actual? I th we've been asking road. the city that question. We, <laughs> uh, I, I can't. 
do you want me to try and answer and then if I can't maybe Tom can address this if I do it incorrectly. So my yeah. understanding, Claire, is that there is going it's gonna be there is an agreement that the Capitol Plaza is gonna grant permission for the public to use this access. It will still be private property technically underneath there that Capitol Plaza will continue to own it, but that in exchange for the city agreeing to do certain types of maintenance, the Capitol Plaza is agreeing to let the public use that area. Is that a very general description, Tom? That's pretty close. Okay. Yes. Thank awesome. You. So, Tom McArdle with the Public Works Department. So, hey, Tom, just we're yes. going to have everyone okay, sure. to solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under a Payne's penalties perjury. I do. Okay. So, just state your name for the record. So, Tom McArdle, Director of Public Works. So, um, what we had in mind is something similar to uh, what we had in practice for quite some time on Stonecutter's Way. Um, the portion of Stonecutter's Way that passes by Sarducci's um, is a public thoroughfare agreement. Um, it's an agreement the city entered into with the Pomerleau family. Um, so that's what I envision. The details of that have not been finalized, what's included, but it is really for the public's use and serves a, as a right-of-way to uh, connect this parcel that would otherwise not have street frontage. So it's an alternative to that. And then with the where it where it meets State Street, would that have to be widened for turning, like a tr like large vehicles to turn in and out? Uh, no. So the the uh, um, intersection at the curb cuts, uh, I think it's better reflected if you look at the at the site plan. Uh, it's a 24 foot roadway driveway through to the just to, off to the, the curb cut. So just the, off this plan. I don't know if that shows the, the flares that um, the tip downs are actually a little wider that the, the actual curb cut is a little wider so the, so the radius is kind of built into that driveway. So the, the fencing that's there now and that landscaping that currently provides that kind of gateway into that parking lot, would that have to change? The fencing, I'm not sure. I, I, was, I don't believe there's there's a need to change That's much of what here. you see right. here today. It functions as a parking lot access. Uh, the the alterations are primarily internally internal. So that that curb cut has served as a parking lot access for for a long time. It has sufficient width. It has the appropriate radii. And there is a fence there. I just don't recall how mm -hmm. far back it is. It's back, there. it's back here, Tom. Yeah. Okay. The, there is a change in the in the curb cut um, design on the Taylor Street side, and that's uh, primarily uh, required by um, by our plans to reconstruct Taylor Street. So there's some alterations in how that looks uh, compared to what it will be under this plan, and which is coordinated with the Taylor Street project. And would there have to be any kind of crowning of that road, or like how does all that work and interface with the existing surface area of the parking? That's I think that's a better question for the site designer for the for the plaza lot. But there's uh, um, I believe there's center drains within the roadway, so it's a reverse crown. It's, um, I call them Texas drainage systems. So. Claire, just um, maybe as a, a point of order, I think in general, I think we should keep in mind that the Capitol Plaza as a project was approved with a lot of these right of ways already. Um, and so some of the drainage that's existing in them has been reviewed by the DRB. Um, that's not to say I think your line of questioning is uh, spot on for what we should be asking, but uh, just keep in mind that there was that prior review uh, so that some of these some of these proposals aren't necessarily brand new. So the pedestrian circulation, I know we've talked about it, but it looks like there's a sidewalk. Is that does that go all the way from State Street <laughs> down to the parking garage? 
It does. It, go, it goes along the, uh, the uh, Capitol Plaza side of the parking lot, goes down to that crosswalk there where it lands on a pedestrian plaza. Access to the garage is from that plaza, and if you walk a little bit to the, to the west, uh, access to the hotel. Um, that sidewalk extends from that plaza down between the hotel and the parking garage to, uh, to a point where it turns easterly and follows the train tracks to connect with the bike path. I'm just uh, trying to scroll it out here. So that, is, that entire route is uh, ADA compliant. Um, this plan, this, this is sort of, uh, it's, it, there's so much stuff on this plan, it's really hard to read. But, but the, the pedestrian way would follow, yeah, where Dave's cursor is and connect with the bike path here. We were asked to evaluate and did evaluate providing pedestrian access via the Haney lot to the uh, bike path. Uh, we've run into some technical issues that make that somewhat difficult, the biggest being that there's, a, there's a, about an eight, eight and a half foot exchange of grade between finished grade around the garage and, and the elevation of the bike path where it, where it mounts the bridge to go across the Winooski. Um, we, uh, we couldn't find a, a, a method to get up from ground level to that level without, without creating problems for other aspects of the engineering design uh, related to floodway management. Um, but we did have a conversation with the Design Advisory Committee to explore the possibility of a, of a sort of bridge going from the garage to the bike path from the second level of the garage. Um, and we agreed to explore that with the uh, Design Advisory Committee. Um, the other part of that that makes it difficult, I pointed out to you earlier, which is the, uh, the fact that we have to maintain that um, right away easement from the Haney lot to the uh, adjacent garage parcel. The uh, Overlook Partnership or something like that, I think it's called, are the owners of that. Uh, otherwise, there are sidewalks, uh, you know, uh, connecting. Um, there's, there's, this, there's the sort of walkways that go along the northerly edge of, or the southerly edge of our proposed new road uh, to get back out to Taylor Street. Um, there's discussion that I believe the Christ Church is talking about a pedestrian access on their property sort of running parallel to the garage but right along there. Um, I think that's all the circulation stuff I can think of. Um, I'm going to go back because I forgot one question about the right of way. Um, and it says right of way, proposed right of way or easement. Um, that's still, you indicated, in process. Um, well, I, th I think they've, they've just said, they've just explained how it was. When we started this, when we submitted, we were still waiting for, for a read on that. But it sounds like they've figured that out. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. So my understanding, mm -hmm. and from from everything we've gotten, is that it's going to be a easement. It's going to be a master agreement, and then an easement between right. the two parties. And I'm not quite sure what your question is at this point. As opposed to a right of way. Right. Just as opposed to a right of way. I think it's just that these necessarily haven't all been updated for consistency between drawings. Okay. Is my understanding. If that was your question. Yeah. I just pulled this drawing up from a previous okay. hearing. Okay. So let's talk next about uh, some of the stormwater drainage, um, simply because we may have the map, right map up for that. But uh, how is the stormwater going to be handled, not only on this lot, but presumably it's going to be incorporated into the larger stormwater system that's been approved for the Capitol Plaza lot as well? Ooh, we'll give it a shot. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of Ron Lyon from Du Bois and King, and they have developed a plan uh, in which there will be a number of stormwater management facilities, um, some of them very mechanical in nature, that will basically collect and treat the stormwater prior to leaving this particular development area and ultimately being conveyed in a common uh, pipe that ultimately will tie into the uh, currently 
approved and soon to be under construction stormwater management line that discharges to the north branch. And in this particular case, the uh, keep in mind that all of this existing parking lot and there's basically a low spot right particularly here uh, all of it flows to those low spots and drains to the river without any treatment today so anything that we do is going to be better um, just basically taking off the um, current parking lot surface and substituting it with a building uh, roof is going to be a significant improvement over what we have out there today but nonetheless as part of the program for the development of uh, for the hotel uh, component there will be additional stormwater treatment and likewise for the proposed garage um, the top level basically becomes a replacement of the underlying existing parking lot below it and all of that stormwater will be collected and treated prior to uh, discharge to the receiving waters. So again, we expect a big improvement in stormwater quality leaving this. This is going to be subject to a state stormwater permit, uh, operational permit is what we call it. And uh, that will all be subject to the technical review of the state as part of the redevelopment of this particular area. Uh, that's a very general answer to your question, but nonetheless, it wanted to get started at sure. least with that aspect. Well, what, what particular type of treatment are you proposing for the parking garage? Well, the parking garage itself, we're looking at a, uh, a swirl separator or vortex unit, and what it does is uses uh, basically centrifugal force that takes the water and basically sends it around and around in circle just about like you are uh, a dryer when you're trying to basically take those drops of water out of your clothes and, and whip them to the very outside or specifically even your washer when you're in the spin cycle. It uses the same type of technology where you're taking centrifugal force and you're taking those particles which have a higher density than water and it forces them all out to the outside of this particular unit. They coalesce on the outside edge of the treatment unit and basically fall down into a collection area within it. And these are required to be maintained. The city has indicated through their vector truck has provided that we can cite these in a manner that allows them access that this is something that they can regularly um, monitor and basically pump out on an as necessary basis as part of their management of this particular property. So we find that in these particular redevelopment projects where there isn't a lot of uh, area available for you know what otherwise would be wonderful by retention areas or rain gardens or uh, large open water ponds that these particular subsurface treatment uh, mechanisms especially when infiltration is not an opportunity because of high groundwater table or poor soil characteristics that these particular swirl or, or more technic type of uh, treatment units uh, does a uh, significant does a very good job uh, <laughs> providing treatment compliance with the state stormwater rules. So is this driven by gravity? So Absolutely. Okay. So it does require a certain amount of elevation change between your inlet and outlet and that amount of energy is used to basically create the centrifugal movement of the water. Ultimately it leaves the unit at the lower elevation but in the meantime there's a sump below the normal um, location where the water is moving to basically collect the sediment that again is forced to the outside or inside and, and uh, settling out. Now are all levels of the garage going to have that same uh, system? I think I was reading that there's going to be a different one for the top and uh, the second and first layers right here. Excellent, sort of treatment. excellent question. Uh, great segue into ultimately how parking garages are managed as far as as far as drops of water hitting each particular surface. So we talked about the top, and that's the one that basically is subject to the majority of the precipitation that falls out of the sky, needs to be managed in a way consistent with federal regulations that basically say anything on top is considered to be stormwater. Anything that's inside the building is actually a sanitary waste. So um, even though you've got some drops of water or snow that comes in the car and melts off and hits the ground and basically slowly trickles into the drain, um, anything inside the building is considered to be a sanitary waste and has to be handled accordingly. So in this particular case, uh, the mid-levels of the garage, the one below the top, but also below the very bottom, above the bottom, I should say, 
all have their own collection system that go into an oil water grit separator before basically gets introduced into the municipal sanitary collection system that then goes to the treatment plant. The very bottom level is one in which we have found our clients have different approaches as far as uh, management. Some basically acknowledge or basically state, gee, Dave, you really don't really need much in the bottom, primarily because we don't see a significant amount of water getting to the drains. A lot of it evaporates before it actually gets to the drains. It will sit on the surface. You'll see a wet surface, but actually what gets to the drain is a very small amount. Some people will say, gee, I'd like to have a pump station in there, and we'll send it up to final treatment, uh, and then to the sanitary system. And other people simply say, I don't want to spend money on a pump station only because they work so infrequently that the seals will dry up, and that I would just ultimately just like to have a holding tank, and I'll monitor its depth and pump it out when it's necessary. So some people will throw in an extra factor safety where there's a monitoring component uh, as far as a float level inside that particular holding tank and that's the one the city has chosen to proceed with in this particular case because there's a secondary benefit in the fact that what we want to do is that um, we know that in this particular corner uh, this is an area that uh, probably annually does have some higher water levels sometimes associated with ice back up and the city doesn't want that backing up into the bottom of the garage in a way that it's actually using the internal drains to only send it back to its wastewater treatment plant. So in this particular case, we separate the entire bottom level into a holding tank, a, a water, uh, water tight, water protected holding tank. And basically anything that gets in there stays there uh, if there ever happens to be a flood event. Now, keeping in mind that our entire it's not our, not my downtown, it's your downtown, um, is all within the floodplain. You know, we need to plan for those particular contingencies. So the city at this point in time has chosen to basically go with the holding tank option for the very bottom floor and to basically provide monitoring or automatic monitoring so that, uh, you know, when it does approach, if it does approach a high point, that uh, they get the signal to send the vector truck down there and to, and to clean it out. So, did dip a little bit into the, the site plan, but uh, which is fine. I, but I, I think it is important to understand how these two relate because the stormwater for the creation of this lot is going to be accepting a great deal of water from the other, other lots by design. Right. Um, so I want to ask about. Uh, so my understanding is that you've you've met with the fire chief and with the chief of police in a technical review committee capacity. That is correct. Yeah, both both during the previous approval period and, I, and as a part of this effort. Okay. So one thing, and I'm going off of the notes, the staff report, um, is the idea of security cameras. Right. That are going to be placed. And if you could just explain Can where you're going to be placed, what the, what the function and purpose are of those cameras. The, um, the, the hotel folks, uh, we'll have, you know, security, the, the normal security we would provide, um, which is cameras on, on operable exits and entrances, uh, and then on, on significant uh, uh, features like this backyard patio here, or, uh, or for instance, the front, you know, this, this whole drop-off area. Um, for the city, uh, the most important area is this area back in here on the back side of this. Um, along the tracks and adjacent to the railroad bridge, is, you know, it's, it's, it's been a place where people have kind of congregated to party and stuff. You know, it's, it's um, so from, from the police's point of view is, is they'd like to have eyes on this area back here. There's a lot going on. The bike path is coming through and you've got the, the parking garage. So we would have, we would have building mounted cameras on the major corners and at the major entrances and exits. There's a pedestrian exit down here. Um, and then we will likely have them on, uh, on each level of the elevator lobby, and we'll probably have a set on, on each set of stairs. That can be monitored at, uh, at the police dispatch. Uh, the, the cameras would be remoted to uh, um, 
there as well as there's going to be some communication between this facility and City Hall as well, uh, both for the security management but also to manage the actual parking garage equipment. So there'll be a, there'll be a, a link between the garage and, and City Hall and the police department out back. So this area here that's on the south side of yes. the garage, will someone be able, you're, you're saying there'll be an exit here uh, from the parking garage, is it going to go to the south or to the east? Well, it's currently shown on the drawings going to the south. Um, it, it's been th th this cross hatching here indicates a setback from the river. Okay, so the actual setback line is here. The shading is just sort of to show restricted to development. Um, we've also been asked to provide some kind of pedestrian access out the side of the garage, going this way. Um, so. Uh, Finish grade down here is all significantly lower than the bike path. Uh, there's a retaining wall that kind of comes along here and separates the train tracks from that from that depressed area. Um, and that's that's an area we're going to want to keep an eye on from a security point of view. Uh, the lighting plan that reflects that as well. <laughs> well. I'm just trying to understand as well. So so someone can come out this back door into this area, or can because this will this will largely be this southern part all one level yeah right here so someone could come around here or come back from here access the bike path well the bike the bike path asks access is tricky because of that exchange of grade okay so um, it's actually going to be up above it's the, it's about eight and a half feet above uh, if this is at uh, nominally at two eight or five eighteen you know this is like five twenty five twenty six twenty seven five twenty five at the tracks right at the tracks you know, so, you know, we've got that little bit of grade change there. So um, this will still be sort of like a bridge this far yes. on the map? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're, we're thinking, uh, yeah. It's currently designed to have its own retaining wall to basically allow it to be up at the railroad track elevation and then the remaining area just to the north of the bike path would go back down to existing grade. Yeah, so everything. They did that primarily to minimize the amount of fill being placed within the floodplain. Um, but it does create this dynamic of significant elevation change between existing conditions and the new bicycle path. And then, um, so I mean, what is the, <clears throat> what is the city's plan to you know, we have these cameras set up, um, and I believe I've read that the city would see these cameras more as an after-the-fact evidence-gathering device as opposed to an ongoing sort of monitoring. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't That's talk to him. Yeah, I mean, I, this is obviously third-hand information, uh, but nonetheless, as part of the Technical Review Committee, the chief indicated that they don't have the staff to basically just sit there and monitor cameras all day. Uh, but in this particular case, it would allow for uh, after the fact review of uh, what is what occurred on the property, uh, whether it be to gather evidence or otherwise, um, how active it is used to basically monitor, I think is again just depending on who's available to sit down at the chair at that particular point in time. But as far as a constant monitoring, that was not the police department's intent from what I understand. Were there any concerns expressed by either the fire or police department about the, this, this area here or the design as far as uh, either a fire safety or a public safety concern? Uh, the, fire, the fire chief had a, a list of conditions that he wanted to have included in the approval of the project if it gets to that stage, um, including uh, things that we, we had already planned on doing. but. Uh, making sure that there was a fire suppression system, a sprinkler system basically in the building. They wanted stand pipes in each of the two stairwells, which is fine. And, um, uh, well, I think it's in the staff report. He had, he had enumerated some bullet points. But it's a type one or non-combustible kind of building. It's, uh, it's a low fire hazard um, type of structure because I mean, they, they will have car fires. They will happen. But, um, uh, for the most part, you don't have a lot of contents here compared to a cotton warehouse. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the police, uh, the police didn't 
expressed concern about the location so much as just uh, as just wanting to participate in whatever kind of security arrangements we had there to you know to, to, to have to have the ability to look out at what's going on back there uh, the hotel will monitor uh, their camera system from the front desk right. and the city's staff or however they manage the parking equipment you know that'll go the, the, the line that comes to city hall it's all, it's all done over the internet now so a anybody can bring up one of these cameras so uh, but th that's those are the discussions we've had to date yeah if I can just add one thing as far as uh, working with the the fire chief we did ask him specifically whether he was comfortable with the parking garage and he says well it's no different than how we respond to park other parking garages specifically up at one national life in regards to what our capabilities are and how we approach these particular types of incidents so that gave us a level of comfort that we weren't creating a new uh, expectation on emergency services and with regard to this particular parking facility And, you know, I think there was a concern expressed before at one of the meetings about, you know, the public safety ramifications, but if what, in, in part because we're transferring, you know, the, this project proposes to transfer ownership and oversight from the hotel that has a vested interest in mm -hmm. its own security, it's on site, it's sort of centralized to the city that's going to have to um, manage it within their public safety existing public safety services or expand said services um, so for subdivision it sounds as if the police are comfortable with the existing proposal um, is that accurate uh, yes yeah. our understanding yes yeah. objection here sir <laughs> <laughs> Evidence do not have a place here be, um, in the same way as they do in court, Mr. Whitaker. Um, um, and just a quick note my comments in the staff report that are based on the fire chief and police chief's comments they have reviewed. Okay. Um, okay. A lot of the questions I had are with the. the is the expectation that this master and easement agreement will be executed prior to the next few weeks, our review, or is this something? I mean, I, I, I think some of my concerns are just simply in defining what is the scope of control um, for the city taking this over. I see. Um, well, it, it took us till this point until last week really to sort of figure out all the plumbing issues now that we have those figured out I mean the, the primary issues are, are water sewer and electric um, yeah the, 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 now that we know where those lines go I think it's probably a relatively easy thing to sort of put a, a description of an easement over the top of them and I should be clear I'm not looking to scrutinize um, the lawyers work or you know look at the actual documents but just have an understanding in general how are the relationship between the parties being being proposed through these documents so that we have an understanding as to responsibility rights you know I think there's been statements made before by the city that you know ultimately they would like to see these as public streets well is this is this agreement such that that precludes that or allows for that just so we can understand really what we're approving and and I think that that's just something that it may not be there, but it may be something. Um, I'm just trying to get a sense of, of whether that's reasonable for us to expect more clarity. Uh, Sue or Bill? Yeah. <laughs> so same same thing. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Um, for the record, my name is Bill Fraser. I'm the city manager of Montpelier. I, that was probably one of the early questions for Greg. Um, but I would say we have draft agreement in, it's been prepared. I actually expect to get it to uh, Capitol Plaza by as early as tomorrow. Um, we've already gone through most of the terms, all the terms with them, and putting some of the, as Greg said, some of the final lines in. So I, I actually, unless there's some surprise, I expect we will have it signed by the next meeting. So again, by the time we vote. Great. And is it, Bill, just does that, 
Does that include things like maintenance? Um, yes. used to maintain the roads, snow We actually removal. have a three-part agreement. There's a master agreement that describes all the relationships. Then there's a specific uh, parking permit agreement uh, for their use of the garage and that they'll pay and that sort of thing. And then uh, there's a lease agreement with us for the park, surface parking that we'll be leasing. And then actually in the master agreement, it describes the road and its relationship with our permanent public access and maintenance who's going to do what, uh, and none of that would preclude uh, in the future, as Greg mentioned, it's all being constructed to city standards, so in the future, if we were to move in the direction of it being a city road, we could. In the meantime, it would be a private road with a permanent public easement over it. Okay. Thanks. So let's talk about uh, yeah. Just making sure I get all of my notes. Uh, well, let's talk about the traffic impacts at this point, um, and this may be where the RSG. Um, so, I mean, essentially what we're doing is we're, we're proposing to put a new lot here that's going to have... Uh, can I make a suggestion that we... Yeah. I mean, so the, I mean, as far as the subdivision itself is concerned, what we're really looking at under the subdivi subdivision regulation is the traffic impact of the creation of new lots. Right. Not the development on those lots. Um, the creation of one additional lot in this location, I don't think. Like, so usually, if you had a 26 lot residential subdivision, that subdivision is going to create traffic impacts, and that's what you would consider under the subdivision regulations. Uh, if it's a two lot subdivision of an existing parking lot and an existing developed lot, I don't see the subdivision as raising any traffic impacts. Um, so I'd suggest that we. Right. I mean, and I don't. I think it's just going to be easier to get into the traffic impacts of the proposed garage when we look at the site plan. Right. That's one board member's perspective. Just one. Um, no, that's a fair. That's a fair point. And I mean, you know, I don't think we're precluded from looking at traffic under subdivision, but I think it's a well taken point that it may make sense to wait till the site plan. Um, sorry to make you get up. Right. Um, <laughs> you can stay here. We don't. Unless, the, unless, you, unless there, I'm wrong that there will be impacts of the creation of, of one additional lot in this location, absent uh, looking at the development that may occur on that lot. Or that's proposed. I think in this case, I mean, I, I don't think we can look at this separate as, you know, they're just creating one lot. Maybe they'll put a, a, a one-family bungalow there. Um, I think, you know, the cat is out of the bag as to what's going there and yeah. it's, it's intertwined but I think I think that's that's a fair point to put that in in further and we can certainly hold off on that um, but at least from traffic circulation earlier there had been a proposal to put some of the in entrance in ingress and egress on the Heaney lot is that off the table or is that still part of the proposal we have provided for a secondary access point to the garage exiting out to the Heaney lot. But our understanding operationally is that that is only there as a sort of fail-safe uh, in case something happened at the main entrance up above. And th th I think that came out of uh, consultation between the city manager's office and, uh, and St. Albans, who recently constructed a downtown parking garage and they thought that was an important feature to have. We have not assumed that significant flows of traffic will go through the garage and out to the Haney lot because Elm Street is is kind of dysfunctional at the moment. So, But, but uh, yeah, the, the, there's an entrance there, but it's not meant to be used on a regular basis. It's there, it's there as a fail-safe. So. And the other portion, since we're over here, is is this dedicated as access then along this eastern boundary? I the parking lot and I of overlook. I believe there's an easement. Uh, there's there's some kind of agreement, but that they have they have a right 
to the access that parking lot that we have to preserve. Okay. And, and will that be preserved through the construction process as well? The sequence of construction on an urban lot like this is pretty difficult. I think the, the best we can do is we have a, a terrific uh, construction management team in terms of DEW. Um, is to make sure that they know the contact information for the people who own that building and that parking lot, um, and that if there's any, if there's going to be any activities that might preclude them getting in there, like excavation for a water line or something, uh, that they get plenty of notice. Um, because it's hard to imagine building a structure where we wouldn't have to cross that line at some point, um, or at least you know impact that easement to some degree. So I, th I think. I think that'll be a construction management problem to solve, but we've had this issue on every project we've done. It, it, uh, so it's it's a communication matter. Uh, for purposes of this, we want to acknowledge that that exists and we're going to maintain that access. Uh, the only thing that we haven't talked about is the fact that the distance between the garage's access to the easement is closer to the quote unquote driveway for Christchurch than technically it's supposed to be if you consider them both driveways. Um, it's supposed to be a distance. Oh, it's page seven. Hold on one second. Yeah, I think the minimum is 50 feet and it's less than that but it's one of those things that the board can approve as less right so just make sure that you guys had had a chance to just ask any questions you had about that well do you know what is the distance between the and so Meredith just for clarity we're talking about from this point to this point yep yeah. um, and I estimated that based on the plan as no, just it, it looked like it was 30 plus feet, but less than 50. I think that's really determined by the, the yeah. geography of the Exactly. Yeah. So it's just it was just calling it out as something that when a final decision is made on the subdivision, you'll have to make it, you know, allow that to happen. Well, do we know what that number is? I'd want to measure it accurately to, to, to have something in the record, but I, I think your sense of it is right. It's it's probably somewhere around 36, 38 feet. So it'll just need to be something you approve. Which would I mean it's 12 or 14 short of that. But it, we're connecting to existing features in both directions, so. Exactly. Is there a plan for some sort of internal signage for traffic flow, stop signs, or? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, I, I in the project site in general. Yeah, I, I, I'm a little I'm a little unsure on how that fits in with the sign ordinance because we're going to have to have a kind of a master plan sign thing going on for for commercial signage, um, but right. traffic signs they're separate and apart, right? When they're in the public right of way, and honestly, I haven't looked see if I'm assuming that kind of flows with the public access easement, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Okay. And I, I don't think we've had time to discuss how that all is dealt with yet. But I know that there have been discussions about internal signage. So there were, uh, just to fill in the blanks as far as what Meredith's uh, recollection is, there were basically just two minor discussions in regards to the wayfinding component. We think it's an important component of the project, but nonetheless, at least on the traffic management end, um, a stop sign at this particular intersection basically or both actually for that matter to basically keep people from rushing out into the, the public rights of way and then the other thing as far as management of the hotel guests within the garage they wanted to make sure that uh, when they were looking for Interstate 89 that they didn't go right out to State Street that actually they tried to find the path of least resistance getting out in that particular direction again just as a way of trying to minimize additional conflicts <coughs> within uh, the already challenged areas of the city. So there has been some very 
preliminary discussions as far as that. Um, I think ultimately the wayfinding pa sign package is going to be an important component of uh, the project that we envision that as a separate application so that it can basically be a good standalone component um, ultimately of the project prior to uh, occupation of any of the proposed improvements. Right. But it strikes me one of the reasonable conditions that might have to attach for such, you know, because of the shortness of that mm -hmm. and because of the fact that, you know, you would have, this would become this intersection here, and I, I actually wasn't thinking of this until we, we started talking about this, but, you know, because it's essentially a four-way intersection there, right. you know, some sort of signage to create a four-way stop or a similar proposal. Mm -hmm. and I, I guess I'll put that out now since we're likely be continuing this if that if something like a condition of a four-way stop sign would be um, counterproductive um, so I think we do need to discuss with public works what their goals are with regard to uh, the flow of traffic and whether this truly becomes a four-way stop or a two-way stop as far as controlling access out into the main travel way so your points well taken in the fact that that will be a traffic management component that right. maybe on, not on subdivision plan, but on site plan, on site plan we need to basically make sure that we have those details included. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on subdivision? Claire? Is the creation of this lot creating any non-conformities on the adjoining lot? No. Uh, in terms of minimum lot size, the, the Capitol Plaza parcel was large enough to cab off a half acre without falling below any kind of minimum thresholds uh, in terms of lot size. I think the only nonconformity is the one we've already talked about, which is the, uh, the frontage requirement. And, and we've talked about what the workaround is on that. Um, but otherwise, the lots are big enough. It's a no setback zone, so creation of new lot lines isn't going to impose any new restriction on anybody else. So no, I, I wouldn't think so. Anything else? All right. Um, why don't we wait till the end, and then we can consider motions um, to either continue or to, uh, however the board feels. I mean, my feeling at this point is that there's still some open parts to this that may make sense to continue it to our next regularly scheduled meeting. But given that these are all interrelated, we may have a different disposition after the next two applications. Yeah, let's actually do that before we move on to the next one. Does anyone have public comment on the, um, on the subdivision? Go back to the subdivision plan. There you go. Lights on? No, no, that's okay. Uh, lights yeah, on? Please. So, I don't need that. And so let me just swear you in, Steve. Whitaker. Okay, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth under pains and penalties for Yes. All right. Um, am I to understand that all the grounds that you discussed in this session are uh, available for cross, so to speak? They, even if they strayed into site plan, they were yeah. subdivision. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna obviously if it's if it's heavily into site plan, I may pull you back. That's uh, fine. I just we're I gonna expect as much just to keep the meeting moving. Uh, the site plan fundamentally impacts the setback requirement. It, if in effect you're approving a site plan with the intent of building to the absolute limit of the setback, you are in effect uh, creating a congestion that runs directly counter to the goals of paths interconnecting and pedestrian transit, etc. Similarly, the site plan divide, currently there's no vehicle access from the Bashara lot into the Haney lot, for better or for worse. But in effect, this is in effect creating that. And the implications of that are far reaching because in effect, you're, you're going to be 
narrowing the right of way for the garage parcel uh, to, I'm told, 10 or 20 feet through that little canyon, uh, as well as providing emergency, if not full ingress, egress from the garage, well, interconnected. Can, to I, can I ask? Sure. I, I just want to clarify. When you say the, the canyon, <coughs> the 10 foot canyon, you're talking about the pedestrian? No, I'm talking about the one between the, the canyon between the, the Jacobs garage and the proposed garage. Oh, okay. So we're in the east, east down into side. the funnel. Correct. Um, the site plan division is creating these new issues uh, of the traffic coming into the garage from the Bashara lot and exiting the garage uh, through into the Haney lot. Those, those are, um, I, I'm not saying I have a solution for them, but I'm saying that these are issues that, but secondly, what occurs to me is that you're, you're creating a new intersection in the middle of a private lot that the city has a vague or soon to be defined easement to. But that intersection, that fundamental intersection, is curb cut is supposed to be 30 feet, but then it's you're throttling that down to 24 feet in order to go to Taylor or to State. So you're defeating the very purpose of a 30 foot frontage by allowing it to be throttled down to 24. So moving this fast with this project under such pressure is creating more problems than it's solving. And I'm, I'm just calling that to your attention. I don't have a solution for it other than to <coughs> slow down, scale back, and consider our other options. Um, I'll, I'll try to rein into the there's not only Green Mountain Power in there, there's Sovereignet and, and Level 3, I believe. There's two fiber carriers along that same high voltage line. Uh, one of those is going to need to be accessible and accessed in the garage in order to provide the connectivity to get this video over to. But that video won't work in a power outage in a result of a flood zone if we don't put backup power in, into the design. Um, I, ha I did send an email. I'm happy to forward it to Meredith, to uh, Chief Fakos over the weekend after reviewing the staff memo, uh, calling his attention to the need for not only above floodplain utility vault access, but possibly backup generator and transfer switch so that the elevators could work in an emergency situation. Um, that may be getting on into the third phase of your. <coughs> A private road to city standards is not going to allow perpendicular parking backing into it. In effect, this, this perpendicular <coughs> parking along this so-called private road fundamentally defeats the pretense that this is not going to create a huge traffic problem. The, I'll call your attention to the original the waiver back when you granted the hotel mm -hmm. of the five or six spots that were required for loading. And to not have to have given the hotel a waiver for loading zones, and yet all this laundry from 80-something rooms is going to be wheeled across this private road with all the perpendicular parking and the traffic for the garage. It, it, you're engineering a cluster uh, floral arrangement. <laughs> uh, Christchurch pedestrian access was mentioned. Uh, design review I sat through earlier. It was represented that there's a 40 foot stretch of the proposed garage, which is going to be blank, which is, as I understand directly, what Christchurch does not want to have affordable housing built staring at a, a blank wall 10 feet across the canyon. Um, so again, these are, these are problems that I don't have solutions for. Uh, well, you know my solution. Uh, uh, you, groundwater, stormwater, what about wash water? The green walls do not live or thrive in areas where the, the brake dust and rubber particles from a concrete garage are not 
power washed out every several weeks. So you covered stormwater from the top deck, and then you covered uh, sanitary waste from the lower decks. Neither of those systems are designed to accommodate power washing this garage and the cost of such and the water flow from such uh, treatment. Uh, and how are those pumps going to work in a power outage situation? Uh, that's something that has to be considered. Um, which which pumps are you talking about? The sump pump that they mentioned? By sump pump, and then the other is a vortex gravity. That was gravity. Yeah, that's that wouldn't require necessarily a. I mean, the gravity still works in power outages. Oh, it does. Okay. I've heard. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I believe that whole dimension of this needs to be more thoroughly examined, either in the technical review. I'll be asking for the minutes of the technical review committee. Um, that's enough for now. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Um, the power washing question, it does seem, um, I mean, is there, is there a plan to have power washing? James, are you still here? I am. I, uh, Can you go up to the microphone? Absolutely. A microphone, any microphone. Sit right here. You were supporting. I was, yeah. James Finley, Sheriff's Landscape Architect, Wagner Hodgson. Um, I have not actually um, thought about power washing the plants on a regular basis. We've been working with a company called Green Screen that provides these armatures for training vines on buildings across the country. Um, I can check in with them and see if they think that's... Uh, something that's necessary in our discussions um, that was never brought up by the rep or the technical people on their team. Uh, they actually also gave us several case studies where we uh, they had these screens on parking garages and the plants seemed to flourish. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to check in with them and I was going to also check in with some sort of a, to get their recommendations on general maintenance. And so I think we could provide that absolutely and be sure. I mean, at least for the subdivision portion, I understand that to be a question of are you increasing the storm water load from, you know, as opposed to rain events now, regular right. watering or power washing events where, you know, the system uh, would be used. <coughs> Yeah, I, I'm not ready to concede that, that power washing is an appropriate way to treat plant I'm not life either. to begin with. I'm I'm not either. Either. I wasn't talking about power washing the plants. I was talking about power washing the garage to right. prevent, the, to make sure that the plants survive. Um, can I step in for just a second yeah. again? So if we're power washing the garage, my understanding from Dave was that that would mostly, except for the top floor, that would be internal. So that wouldn't go through the stormwater system. That would go into the large tank at the bottom that eventually gets sent to um, the water treatment plant, correct? It's all the stuff on the top. It's only the stuff on the top top that would end up in the stormwater system. Very close. OK. Um, middle levels would go to, by gravity, right. to an ore water grit separator. Uh, that then would go to the sanitary system. Right. Bottom level is all enclosed within holding tank, and then the top is stormwater, Mother Nature's water, um, basically all managed through that particular swirl technology. So the power washing would not in any way increase stormwater flows. It would increase potentially sanitation flows. That is correct. It, but that, it, that would be done on a choice by public works based on what times make the most sense for them both from a maintenance standpoint as well as whatever is happening at the treatment plant. All right. So let's move on to the site plan amendment for the Capital Plaza Corporation. And Meredith, maybe just give just a brief recap as to what we're looking at for this this particular portion of the application. Okay. So this is the hotel site plan amendment. So here we are dealing with an amendment to a previously approved permit um, that is still open. It has not been constructed. Um, and so it was approved under the previous 2011 um, regulations. So those are the regulations we have to deal with for all of the substantive issues. And the board is limited at this point in what it can question 
about the hotel site plan amendment to the changes being proposed. And in this case also impacts from the garage because the reason we're changing the hotel is because of building, changing where the, who owns the garage and how big the garage is. So, um, you know, in general, the big picture for the hotel site plan is converting on-site parking to off-site parking. That's the big reason that this was filed. However, in developing the garage site plan application and dealing with traffic flows and pedestrian access, um, my understanding is that there have been additional amendments discussed that may impact things like how parking is dealt with on the access route to State Street, things like that that may be discussed today that aren't actually in the application, but that were discussed at Technical Review Committee. The big picture, though, is conversion to offset. So, Greg, maybe it would be helpful to go over what you understand the changes to the site plan. Do you have a <coughs> different... Uh, no, I, I think for for just to explain how that previously approved site plan would be amended. Um, obviously, it's the the fact of the subdivision, so the size and shape of the parcel is being amended. Um, it is the as you pointed out the fact that the parking now is off site which uh, according to your regulations needs to be within a thousand feet, and I think we're we're substantially below that, um, and then uh, and the and the imposition of these easements uh, that we talked about to create the access roads to the subdivided lot. Um, as as we move through the process, there there may be some smaller detaily things that end up uh, a part of this. I can I can think of a couple ready examples. There seems to be an ongoing discussion about a second sidewalk from State Street back to the parking garage. It's been brought up a few times. By the time this whole process is done, that may have worked its way into the process. Um, we've been resisting it on technical base on a technical reasons, but uh, you know it's still a live issue. Uh, and the the only other thing I can anticipate might be uh, some minor revisions to the well, it could be minor, it could be substantial but revisions to the grading plan around the hotel to accommodate the change in the design here. So um, right now, I think the only things we anticipate are the subdivision, the off-street parking, and the imposition of the easements, unless you have. Uh, just So just to clarify, since technical review committee hearing or meeting, we're, you're no longer considering a second s a sidewalk on between the Christchurch and parking along that route there. I know we had discussed that and maybe changing some of the, that parking alignment and the access route to State Street. I'm, I'm sorry, say that again, please. So we hey. talked about potentially putting in a sidewalk <coughs> there and adjustments yes. to those parking spaces. Is that still part of the potential? Or is well, that, that, was, that was one of the things I said could get folded into this as okay. we move forward. OK. Yep. Um, but just quickly, I think that the, the, the problem has, has always been that the, the pavement goes right up to the property line. Putting that sidewalk in would, uh, would, in its simplest form, entail you know putting it just outside the existing parking, but that would have an impact on uh, a pretty significant plantation of white cedars that form the enclosure for the church's memorial garden. So the only way for that sidewalk to happen is for it to push over onto Capitol Plaza land, which is going to ad adversely impact the parking. Okay, yep, I just didn't, I know that we had had a discussion where Dave was thinking about trying to find a way to make that yeah, work. Uh, so. we, we can continue to look at it, but I, those are the issues, and that's that's the source of okay. the resistance. Thank um, you. But other, other than that, no, I, I, I think uh, if grading plans, uh, if the grading plans do transition over time, uh, we'll, you know, we'll make that part of the application. So let me maybe kick off with uh, is something that uh, Mr. Whitaker raised, which I remember uh, from our original review of this, which was the laundry. Yes. That the proposal is that the laundry from the Hampton Inn would be carted across this parking area to right. the Capitol Plaza right. because they have the large industrial washing machines yep. in their facility. Um, is there anything about that that's going to shift? Because, and in particular, 
you know, before what we were talking about was a large sort of central courtyard parking area, whereas now they're going to have to cross this right. Um, so, well, they they have to do the same things they were going to do. But as I understand, as I understand it, I. Th I think they're going to get like a Cushman card or some kind of golf cart type of thing to put this laundry in. Okay, so we're not talking like people with like a giant... With a four-wheel canvas right. thing with the wheels on it? I don't believe so. I, I mean, because uh, the dirty sheets and towels from 84 guest rooms is going to be more than somebody's going to carry in their arms. Um, the other thing is I think operationally is the, the hotel is going to be looking for times of day when guests won't notice this happening. Could be very early in the in the morning or late you know at late at night. Um, oftentimes in hotels, the the night staff does laundry while they're keeping an eye on the front desk. Um, but it did, it didn't make sense to us to have two commercial laundry systems running on the same lot. Uh, to consolidate that into one activity is is efficient for the owners. Is that? Uh, there's a fairly substantial room in the building <coughs> that's created to hold that laundry, so it doesn't like it's not going to be like in bags in the hallway. So, in understanding, you know, it, I, I my sense is that the, the big shift really is that we're talking about changing the nature of these driveways to be now shared with the city with this additional traffic that's going to go to the larger parking yes. garage. Yes. Um, in just understanding from the Capital Plaza's perspective, are there any changes that are they're, they're rendering to their traffic flow or where they expect guests to arrive, unload, that is going to be affected by this change? No, we've, as the design team has tried to take care to maintain a, uh, a, a, a decent sense of a back door here for the hotel, which is right about there. Mm -hmm. Typically, I think guests that arrive at the hotel now are coming in the front door. Once they've checked in, there's a 208 space parking lot back here, right? It's, it's all parking now, 100% with the exception of this little red building here. Um, and no, I don't. I don't see that changing. I think it's just channeled more, because right now when you go in there, it's it's somewhat chaotic. There's there's the, the, the one of the first things we did. I think it was one of the things that got us hired was we said, create a sense of a streetscape here, so that people coming to this hotel feel like they're arriving someplace and not just landing in a parking lot. And so that's always been the the, the operating theory of this design. All we've done now is sort of said, well, this is no longer a private road, you know, Fred's Way or whatever we were going to call it, uh, but but now it's it's got a, a larger public component to it. Uh, but there is still going to be a 220 space parking garage here, with all that traffic going to it. it the, the, the real difference is, you know, we're going up to 348 spaces now, or 349. So, and just. Right here on the, the proposed hotel, yeah. there's a little bump in that it looks like, and that's still going to be the loading and unloading for those. For the New Hampton Inn, that's where guests will pull out of the traffic line, and that hatching pattern is intended to be a, uh, a stamped concrete pattern, a kind of cobblestone thing, uh, or well, it may, it, may, it may be saw cuts, or, but it's meant to be a special pavement, uh, number one, because, you know, cars stopping at the you know the tripping oil and stuff they don't want that in front of the uh, the hotel they want something they can scrub and it's going to hold up um, but it also tells everybody to slow down right here um, and and so even if like a large tour bus uh, full of leaf beepers stops yep. and pulls in front of there there's still going to be enough room beyond that to get around the them traffic to yeah around. yeah the canopy will be mounted at an elevation that's high enough it should that the that it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, we did, in the process of doing this site design, have uh, do truck overlays on the major turns, which is really that big turn right in the center of the site. Um, but we did we did verify because um, the hotels don't use a lot of truck traffic, but the restaurant 
in the Capitol Plaza gets a lot of deliveries. Right. And they get, you know, they get deliveries from Cisco and, and the, you know, Black River Produce. And generally those are high cube trucks, you know, 30, 40 foot un, unarticulated trucks. Um, but but they do they do get the occasional Cisco truck as a full size semi rig, and um, we also had to show that we could get a fire truck in and out of there. So that that is kind of where that curve came from. And, and the large uh, buses they aren't are, they aren't going to go into the parking deck or are they? Wouldn't even be possible. Yeah, no, there's a fairly limited head height in the garage. With 10 foot 2 floor to floor, you're, we're going to end up with between 7, 6, and 8 foot of clear head space through most of the garage, with the exception of the very lowest level. And so is there a plan for where those will park? Uh, right now they disgorge and they leave the site completely. Okay. They don't stay. Uh, I, I would have to ask uh, Mr. Bashara, but as I understand it, there's a there's a lot out underneath the bridge or something where they go. I but they don't stay on site now. Okay, so they don't park in the back as the existing parking is configured. Oh yeah, you know somebody might have parked one back there at some point, but but operationally, my understanding is they go off site. Is there any proposed any like speed bumps or anything like that on the right of way? Just a special pavement I pointed out to you. Yeah, I don't think we would want them honestly. I, I think traffic is going to, anybody who's experienced that parking lot as it is today should concede that this arrangement is much better because we've sort of channeled the flow of traffic <coughs> to a definite set of lanes and the parking is definitely segregated from that. Um, even, even in the cases where we've got the perpendicular parking, you know, on either side of the main access road, um, there's a clear sense of a driveway there. Whereas the rest of it is, is very much a meander. My question is, it touched on earlier, that four-way intersection, or that intersection, right yeah, here. right there. Yeah. So that's, there's not going to be any specific there as far as, you know, no right turn, no left turn. It's all going to be two-way, you know, no, no, no restrictions. You come out of the garage, you can go, you know, straight or left. You come out of the church, you can go straight or, um, you're right, it's all right. Uh, and you come, you know, come around. There's not going to be any restrictions in that four-way intersection? No, other than the possibility of like a four-way stop or something, but maybe our traffic engineer can <laughs> can add something. I, 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 th I think the, the goal from Public Works was as people come out of here, if they're heading north, on eight, if they're heading back to the interstate, we'd really like to see them come out via Taylor Street and get out to Memorial Drive as quickly as possible, uh, as opposed to coming out to state and then further straining either the intersections of Taylor Street or all the way down to the other end of, of uh, state. Um, but yeah, we're anticipating these to remain as two-way traffic here and here. There's probably going to be some restriction on who can park in here, uh, because that's church property. And as it stands now, they have signs on all their spaces saying, church parking only, violators will be towed. Um, so somebody could come out of the garage, but if they pull in here, they're going to have to turn around and get back out. So the width of the right of way going out through um, to, the, to the north. Up through here. And the width in front of the hotel. Here. Are those the same 26 feet each? Or? Um, I don't, I don't know. I think I'd have to verify. I think this is 24 feet between the backs of the stalls. Yes. This may be a couple feet wider. I just, I, I would have to measure it. I just, but. Uh, right, to provide clarification again, Dave Marshall, um, what's depicted on the plat plan right now as part of the previous review um, was actually 24 feet in both direction in support of basically the city reserving the right for the travelways without encumbering uh, the adjacent areas for parallel parking or perpendicular parking. Um, so that was the intent. And that particular plan you were just looking at was an older idea in regards to what the width could be or might be. So at this particular case, our job is to make sure all the plans say the same thing 
Meredith says, geez, I've been saying that for a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. But to basically bring them all together this week to basically get all the stories straight in regards to exactly uh, what the latest agreements are as far as, uh, as far as the project is concerned. So do we have a width, that, a continuous width? Going all the way through. I mean, well, it's it's the 24-foot number right now. 24-foot. Yes. So no, no narrower than 24 feet. That is correct. Yeah. Um, one thing we want to make sure we touch upon. So how many um, parking spaces will the Capitol Plaza have within the parking deck? Uh, I'm going to ask. Sue or Bill to, to talk about that if, if they're still here. Um. Bill Fraser, um, there won't, the Capitol Plaza, are, nobody will have reserved parking spaces, but they will be purchasing 200 permits, uh, and so they will be allowed to use up to those on as needed. Um, and it's a long, flexible system, which I'd be happy to explain if you want to, but that's so. The same 200 that I think they'd identify for you. Okay, I, we just need on the record that they're having the same number of off dedicated off-site spots as they had with their prior plan. I. Uh, and I'm seeing the nod of Bill Fraser. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, that's the intention. Yeah. Okay, I just simply put it on the record. It's not. Okay. No booby traps in that question. <laughs> no, it's just, I just, I know that originally that garage was approved as having 220 spaces in it, so. I can't answer that about the, the original size. I just want to be clear for the record that they will have two permits. One, it's an important distinction in terms of dedicated spaces. Mm -hmm. They'll have access to them. They will not have reserved spaces. They reserve for Capitol Plaza and on days that they don't need 200 spaces. Those spaces may be used by other people. So, okay, so that's nice. make sure there's no well, confusion in the record, but they will okay. have access to up to 200 as they need based on their permits. It's an automated system. So, I'm not trying to confuse matters, but sure. I just want to make sure that there's My, no misunderstanding that there's 200 spots that nobody else but Capital Plaza can park in any garage. Right. Well, but that I maybe just help me to clarify. So, I, under, I understand sort of from a, a gate admission point of view that they'll have 200, so if somebody has a capital deposit ticket, presumably they'll, they'll, deduct it from that. they'll deduct it from that up to two, and they'll have a credit of up to 200 mm -hmm. um, but if at not, any given if time. Those, in, 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 now we're getting into sort of parking management, and I'm not sure that, I mean, I'm happy to talk about it, I just not sure it's going to be productive for this use. But they will have, there's also the ability to reserve and release, so there's only, half occupancy, no conference that day, they might only need 75 or 80, which means the remaining 120 will be released to the public and can be sold to the public for general use. So I just want to be clear that, that since it's testimony that there's not yep. reserved spaces for Capital Plaza. I, I, I appreciate very important distinction. No, I appreciate that distinction. It, it's just, I just want to make sure. So I understand, because you know, we really are, it, I think it's relevant to this particular part of the application is, and just so they have first me. dibs essentially at, okay. at the, the 200 spaces. I think it's probably the simplest way to put it. Well, Bear with me for a hypothetical, okay. which is you know, say there's a legislative event uh, on a Thursday mm -hmm. and Capital Plaza doesn't need that many spaces, but you get a bunch of people parking overnight for this legislative event. Um, how does that then clear out if the Capital Plaza needs their 200 spots the next day? Is that if they're not reserved, is that something that, that would be worked out? Or? Yeah, we have, we, there's a whole bunch of parking management strategies that work with this, and it's all based on software. And, you know, if, I suppose it depends where the legislative event is. If it's at the Capitol Plaza, then right, well, then I it, guess. Yeah. <laughs> if it's elsewhere, you know, overnight parking is different demand than daytime parking. Hotel guests come at different times. So, um, there's a whole bunch of algorithms that parking garages use and the software manages. And uh, we've gone through all of those with the hotel and we're all pretty comfortable that it works. But on a normal day, what, what it would be is, you know, beginning of the day, 
they would have first dibs on two, right. up to 200 spots unless they had released them. Yeah, or, or conversely, they would, would they have to reserve them one, one way or the other. So mm -hmm. if they know, you know, for example, someone books a wedding next April, they could go in the system and say, we need 200 spaces on April 14th um, because that's going to be a full day that day. And they could just reserve them at that point, whereas, so. Okay. I, uh, I, think, I, I think I understand that it, a little bit better. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. I just want to, you know. Sure, as opposed to a placard on, spa, on a spot saying. They would definitely you know, be double used. Right. It, it'll be sort of like Southwest seating, first come, first serve. Something like that. And the boarding pass is the key. Yeah. Yeah, by the ordinance, the demand for parking is 174 spaces or something like that. It's in the previous approval. And that sweeps up the Capitol Plaza, the Hampton, the new proposed Hampton Inn, and the various and sundry commercial uses that are on the ground floor of the Capitol Plaza. That's 165. Well. 165. So to put just to put that uh, those numbers into a context relative to the ordinance right and that's simply what I want to confirm that's actually very helpful I appreciate the explanation okay anyone have any other questions on this modification to the site plan I have a question yeah. about kind of timing and sequencing of um, How this goes through kind of the city committee approval because um, there was a committee that was sitting here earlier and and there's been reference to a technical review committee process and I was just curious on on the, the timing and sequencing of, of them rendering their decisions and then when that information comes to us so the technical review committee um, it's a I, it's a zoning administrator function to pull together um, comments from Department of Public Works, Public Safety, you know, Fire Chief, um, Tree Board, whoever may have comments on an application, and then I pull those comments into the staff report, or as needed, forward you larger reports like from Department of Public Works. Um, and so that's the flow of the technical review committee. Um, for design review committee, which was the meeting before this, that was actually their second review of the garage site plan. Um, because so far, none of the changes to other things have triggered design review. Um, so the design review committee typically tries to meet a hearing ahead of Deve Development Review Board, and then their decision gets folded into the staff report. However, so far they have made no decisions. Um, so if they had made a decision tonight, I would have reported on that at this hearing so that you can have it. Um, but at this point, they're going to continue and we're going to be trying. I haven't gotten to my report on that because that's for the next application. Um, but I can tell you now that they haven't made a decision um, and we're going to be scheduling a special meeting. We just have not been able to work out our calendar. I had a, another question from a, a, from the particular um, kind of application that we're looking at right now. Is it a waiver that we will be granting for them to park off-site? Um, it, it's not a waiver. It's just a change because they're allowed to have off-site parking. It's just that it has to meet some different criteria to be allowed to have off-site parking versus on-site under the old regulations. It's an amendment, so. Yeah. Just an amendment. Okay. You know, if they had come at the initial, it wouldn't have been necessarily a waiver, but it would have been, we would have needed this information that they're giving us now. Um, that's what we're saying. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, so let's move on to the last of the applications of this evening. Same cast and character. Oh, sorry, public comment. I apologize. Thank you. This is why staff is invaluable. Um, Mr. Whitaker. Um, in discussing this right of way, easement, etc., 
it occurs to me, and this will come up again in the third application's public comment as to the adequacy of the traffic impacts, that if you're going to consider this a street, that every one of, not only the four-way intersection that you've just referred to, which has not been analyzed, the only thing that's been analyzed in pieces is the Taylor Street and the State Street intersections. But in effect, you've got a four-way intersection, and then you've got 26 parking spaces, which are each an intersection, perpendicular parking spaces, are each creating traffic impacts on this street. So I can't overemphasize that point, that the, the volume of traffic and the interrelated uh, complexity of traffic flows from Northfield Savings Bank customers, Christchurch uh, overnight guests in their cars, etc. The the number of complex interactions between the transit center, the hotel, the parking garage, uh, and the Haney lot, which still has some open issues, uh, unresolved issues, uh, is going to necessitate a more rigorous approach to anal analysis. Um, I'm glad to hear about the no plan for speed bumps on our new street, uh, but the more than one guest or more than two guests often apply. I've stayed at the Hampton Inn in Brattleboro and in White River Junction. Um, those loading zones typically ac accommodate two and three guests unloading at once. And keep in mind, this is still only possibly 30 feet wide. So these guests are opening car doors, passenger si driver side doors to get luggage or kids out mm -hmm. while there's two ways of traffic passing by just a few feet away. Yeah. So um, the reassurances about based on software that all this is going to work, I think uh, recent news of algorithms and software should pop that bubble without me having to emphasize it. Um, that's enough for it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. thanks. Okay, uh, let's go on to the last uh, application. Meredith, would you want to just give us an overview? I think this is the, the big finale. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we have a new application for a city-owned Parking garage. Um, there, is this, is this, is this back at Woodward Group? Right. So that's the um, dated October 14th uh, staff report for the uh, major site plan review. Um, it's application number Z 2018-0117. And the development application should list City of Montpelier as the applicant. That's, that's what you emailed? That's the staff report I emailed, yes. Um, and it goes with the development application. It doesn't have staff report cover in your packet. Do you have a copy of that? Of staff the staff report? Yep. I'll take one also. discuss anything in here that anybody wants. That includes traffic. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask if we could go to traffic because 
Yeah. Drag these poor guys out here for tonight. <laughs> He's pinch hitting for for another coworker. So uh, yeah, maybe if we could. Uh, um, uh, I, I actually, I think that would be that would be great because I think a lot of the stuff we that's applicable here we've discussed. We'll just be looking for sort of nuance on that. But the one piece that we really have to talk about is family. Okay. Absolutely. So can you just. That little microphone over here on the other side. Yeah. Oh, there's another one in front of you, Dave, that comes to the other side of the table. All right. And if you just state your name for the record, and I note you were sworn in at the beginning. Yes, I was sworn in. Uh, my name is Corey Mack with RSG, a traffic engineering consulting firm out of uh, Burlington. Uh, so the way that we approached this project here was we uh, basically took the difference of um, uh, well, trip generation, I should just start a little bit. A, a parking garage in itself doesn't generate traffic. It's really the adjacent land uses about how that's all, all being, uh, being used. So um, the traffic uh, generation from this, what we basically did was we uh, determined the difference in traffic or parking spaces that are being provided in the, the, the new garage here versus the existing uh, lot. Um, and what's being replaced, um, and then uh, applied that to the land uses that are um, are being um, kind of backed our way into what the trip generation would be with that. Um, so as we were talking about before, there's the 200 lease spaces for the uh, the Capitol Plaza there. Um, uh, got my notes right over here. If you'll give me a second. Uh, so 200, 200 lease spaces for the Capitol Plaza. There's some uh, multifamily housing that's taking up 30 spaces there. Uh, there's some uh, monthly spaces for uh, office buildings. Uh, those are 80 spaces. Uh, and the remainder um, is uh, open to the public. That's 38 spaces. Um, the total there uh, we have um, for 348 spaces, um, that represents 163 new spaces. Uh, so basically, we're saying those 163 new spaces aren't so much generating traffic, but they're going to represent, you know, a uh, sort of a demand in this area here. So coming and going that wasn't necessarily there to begin with. Uh, so those 163 spaces, the difference there, we then applied um, uh, trip generation rates based on uh, the parking uh, that, that that's uh, providing there. Uh, you know, I can go into a lot of detail on this, or I can go into a little bit of detail on this. Uh, and really what it comes down to is, uh, you know, uh, the, the whole report there kind of outlines where trips were coming in and going out. Um, there uh, is a, a certain number of trips that we calculated as being, uh, you know, what's you know, generated, not so much by the, the parking garage, but by the land uses surrounding it, um, and how that's distributed into the, the transportation network. Uh, and uh, what kind of impacts that has on, on the uh, network. So um, I, don't, I don't know if I didn't cover anything or what you'd really like me to get into it. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of nuance, and I love talking Excel formulas. So. Sure. Um, <laughs> well, I think it may make sense, and I'll let the other board members uh, redirect if they feel otherwise motivated. But to start with the exterior of the site and by that I mean really mm -hmm. the State Street the Taylor Street mm -hmm. you know and obviously the impacts that are going to be felt on the public streets as a result of this this development this, this yes project. absolutely so there was a lot of uh, thought given to how we were going to analyze these and what intersections we were going to analyze uh, so really the, the primary in intersections that we analyzed were going to be the Taylor Street and State Street intersection to the um, to the to the west and uh, Elm Street and State Street to the east a little bit. Um, we didn't analyze in specifically like to get delay and ca all that at the, the driveway entrances because those are um, stop control. That's really only going to impact the people that are driving in and out of there. And, and as you know, uh, really you'll only be going in and out of there if it was um, as like a parking lot. We don't typically look at parking lots unless it's a, a, a large generator. Um, but um, the, uh, we uh, 
we reviewed the volumes. It gets complicated. Uh, we used uh, 2013 volumes to analyze the traffic on, uh, um, on Taylor Street. And there's a reason why we used um, older volumes. It's because they were the highest volumes. So we took this very conservative estimate of the traffic volumes that were there. And that was based on another study done by another consultant, uh, DNK, who was, I think, had been involved with the, the, um, the project in a number of other ways. Um, so we used those 2013 volumes. We escalated that uh, a number of years so that it, uh, we raised the traffic volumes there at 3% for like the background traffic. And then we rooted all the enters and exits onto this site through those two different um, intersections. Uh, and um, what we found uh, was uh, it's going to operate a little, well, I should back out off a little bit too. Um, DNK's previous study that I was referencing is a, um, some recommendations on State Street and Taylor Street, um, specifically some realignment of uh, intersections uh, so that there's um, going to be a different approaches to the uh, um, State, State Street. So there'll be a separate right turn lane and a through left lane on the northbound Taylor Street approach. Uh, the removing the eastbound right um, on State Street. Um, so that's going to have some uh, improvements, and we modeled that as being an existing um, characteristic for the intersection in 2022. Uh, so it'll be better than uh, what we're seeing right now uh, without those improvements. But um, you know, when we add three percent of background, you know, traffic growth to it, um, plus some, you know, I would say relatively minor increase in, in traffic, and um, uh, with the uh, with this. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the proposed garage here um, w w that will have a negative impact uh, on the Taylor Street approach. Um, State Street is a free-flowing movement so and uh, on, on both both of these intersections um, actually I'm not sure about that on Elm Street um, uh, on Taylor Street it's a free-flowing movement so um, it, it doesn't impact State Street but it does have a, a small impact on um, Taylor Street um, in both situations, the Taylor Street approach um, with or without the parking garage um, is not operating at um, what, uh, you know, the uh, typical traffic engineering uh, uh, would uh, give it a, a fail, uh, not failing, F, an LOSF, um, meaning that the delay is pretty high. Um, generally considered unacceptably high, but in a urban environment like downtown Montpelier, um, there are often cases in which LOSF is either the best you can do or you know good enough for what you'd expect at peak hour conditions. What is the, what is that level for this? I mean, what is the un unreasonable delay? Um, yes, so that um, so I've mentioned LOSF. That's level of service. That is essentially a uh, a, a measure of delay to an average motorist <coughs> um, for a stop sign. Uh, that's going to be greater than uh, 50 seconds of delay. Uh, so that means that you're waiting in a queue. Uh, you've like reached where you're trying to get out to that, through that intersection, and you've had to wait 50 seconds or more to get through that. That's the great, the highest level of impact that we we um, really quantify. Um, without uh, the um, uh, that without the parking garage, uh, the proposed parking garage construction, that delay is 62 seconds. Um, we've modeled it as 62 seconds, um, and with uh, the parking garage, it increases to 73 seconds. Um, so uh, it's not too far above. I've seen much higher above that threshold of 50 seconds, but uh, it, it is uh, increasing there. And that's entirely because we're adding some trips to that. Um, uh, and let me state also that that's in the PM peak hour. Uh, so that's going to be uh, like the worst of that, uh, an, uh, you know, your 30th highest day, you know, like the, um, and what are the PM peak hours range from? Uh, you know, I'm not sure in this specific uh, uh, intersection what the PM peak hour is. Uh, it's typically, you know, 430 to 530, um, you know, you have a lot of office traffic here. Um, it might be a little earlier, people um, leaving to go, go home after a day of work. Um, but, you know, there's also the whole, um, you know, Places that you go out to eat and stuff. So and, yeah, typically it's around 4:30 to 5:30, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and these, so the testify is the, these numbers are act actual numbers. They're not theoretical. These are modeled numbers, and there's a, a number of reasons why I would say that this is a very conservative model. Uh, we're first of all we're projecting out to 2022. So uh, there's that whole 
unknown. Um, but like I was saying, uh, we were using um, 2013 volume estimates, which are a lot higher than what we've observed these days. So we're using an old number, uh, but to be consistent with old uh, previous studies and to be kind of conservative and say that the, this high traffic volume is you know, still out there, um, we'll use that as our baseline. Then we're going to grow that at 3% to 2022 to try to estimate what the future is going to be. Although, you know, traffic growth has not been at, you know, that level for, um, you know, that's a, a statewide average that we're trying to use for, um, for traffic growth in this one particular case. Um, so I think that we're kind of escalating the, these traffic volumes. So, um, no, those are not delays that uh, are actual delays. In fact, uh, I think D&K did a, a delay study where they actually like monitored individual vehicles and how they went through on, you know, one day, you know, you can only really look at, you know, discrete periods. Sure. Um, and they were seeing uh, delays in the 40 second range. So actually in, um, uh, in, a, in a range that would be, I think LOSD, um, I think I, I heard uh, cited, but it may have been a higher, a higher LOS, like an LOSE. So that's going to be less seconds of delay um, in an actual observed condition versus what we're showing here in our modeled condition, which has so many of these conservative factors of safety or, or whatever you'd want to call it um, into the traffic analysis. I have a question on the traffic analysis. Was the redevelopment of the multimodal transit center with the apartments above, mm -hmm. was that included in the study of the Taylor Street traffic? Uh, no, it was not, and there's a specific reason for that. This also adds to that conservative analysis. Uh, so um, I, I keep mentioning DNK. Uh, they they were the ones who did that traffic study for the, the that multimodal transit center, um, and their ultimate conclusion came to uh, that the amount of traffic following the implementation of this transit center would actually decrease on Taylor Street. So um, by not including that we are being conservative by having this existing level of traffic that when the trans center is complete, that existing level of traffic should decline based on the, uh, the previous study. Um, so by including the transit center, we would have dropped the existing volumes. So we kept it as in its current, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk about any other questions for the external, for any of these? Uh, you know, I guess uh, I want to make sure I understand for traffic coming out of this area onto State Street, either turning left or right, and particularly the PM peak hours. Mm -hmm. um, I want to understand what, what impact that's going to have on the level of service. On, your on Taylor Street? No, on State Street. Oh, just on, oh, uh, from Taylor Street or from the driveway? Is that uh, your question? Well, specifically from the driveway mm -hmm. onto State Street. So that was one of the intersections. We did not actually study that intersection. Okay. We studied Taylor Street and we studied Elm Street for this level of service. Um, you know, I can tell you that uh, the existing uh, the existing demand, you know, had a certain number of uh, vehicles. Um, going through it, um, we're, you know, increasing, there's 57 exiting trips in the existing demand. Uh, we're adding 41 to that. So it's going to, it's going to be an increase on that driveway. Um, our observations had, had indicated that, you know, it doesn't operate, you know, when we put it in our model and it shows that, you know, there's just a street here where people can drive and do whatever they need to. It doesn't show the downstream effects of queuing. It doesn't show, um, you know, if a pedestrian crosses a street, everybody stops on State Street. Right. And that actually opens up gaps uh, for people to exit because, uh, you know, people are generally pretty nice drivers around here. Uh, so it gives, the, in, the, in the real world, um, our models are usually kind of conservative because it doesn't really look at those external gaps that are provided in, in real world driving conditions. Well, I guess I'm concerned particularly on State Street, you know, there is, as you say, a lot of not only just pedestrian traffic across, 
State Street, mm -hmm. but along State Street as well, mm -hmm. um, which I know interferes with both people turning out of that driveway onto State Street as well as turning in from State Street onto this driveway because, of course, the pedestrians, we all yield to pedestrians. Yes. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to understand or, or wrap my mind around, you know, what impact that's going to have because that becomes one of the two major ingress and egresses for this for this site and um, to understand what what impact that's going to have you know we're particularly in the p.m. hours I know there's a number of employers across the street that will disgorge employees into that stream of traffic then um, mm -hmm. at that time of day they obviously are able to meld into the flow of traffic but what does this add to that or mm -hmm. those existing numbers so um, the majority of traffic exiting um, from the you know the project site onto State Street they're all gonna be or most of them are gonna be turning right I'd say um, you know 80% perhaps um, it's gonna be a, a large number um, I have the exact number in here if you if you want it um, no I mean where does that estimate come from uh, so uh, if you're looking at our memo uh, it would be on, I think, the 60% uh, well, 60% uh, of the site traffic is exiting to the right. So it's going to be uh, figure three there. It has uh, all the kind of the enters and exits as a percentage of uh, the two driveways. Um, but uh, we have a, a, an overall volume. Uh, an overall volume of exiting traffic, uh, the majority of which is going to be turning right. Uh, so it's going to have, you know, it's not trying to cross and turn left, which would be a much more difficult mo maneuver for vehicles. Uh, so it's going to be trying to en enter the, uh, the uh, State Street traffic stream turning right. Uh, there will be the pedestrians crossing. So yes, that, that, that is an issue. Um, and frankly, a very difficult one to model. <laughs> Um, it's a challenge. Yeah, hey, urban environments. Well yeah, urban environments create a lot of uh, a lot of difficulties, and um, and so really all we can do is uh, you know do our best with the models and and kind of ground truth it with what we see out there, um, and that sort of goes to what we had uh, mentioned with the the, the D and K, um, their observations of the actual delay being less than what um, uh, what they had modeled in the existing conditions. Um, uh, well, I was going to say that we didn't specifically look at this intersection, um, like the driveway entrance onto State Street, as a uh, like an intersection for analysis. Um, the volumes are lower than what they are on Taylor Street, so it should operate better than that. But um, you know, there there will be uh, you know there will be delay there, then, probably in a similar number. If there's signage internally. Um directing people to go to Taylor Street mm -hmm. if they want to get on 89 mm -hmm. if they want to you know uh, I, uh, other directions to get them to, to go that way to avoid the State Street intersection well two questions one is that signage going to be effective um, in your expert opinion um, and two um, is that going to create then are we overloading then Taylor Street from people c pulling to Taylor Street and moving and turning left? Um, well, uh, wayfinding is a very important thing. It gets its own section in you know federal guidance on how to design signs. Uh, and I do think that if it's done well, it can be very effective. Uh, you have this one exit from the parking garage, the bulk of the spaces, where everybody's going to be driving through. And you can have like 289 left, you know, two route two left, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I think it could be a very effective uh, uh, tool to, to direct people to where you want to go. Um, when we did these uh, traffic distributions to say that, you know, I was just saying 60% are turning right or something, that's all based on existing conditions. Right. So that's all based on when people are already leaving these driveways, how they're, how they're leaving. So an effective wayfinding thing that has them going exactly where they're going, um, that might change sort of that. But again, that's something that's like very difficult to uh, to, uh, to to model or to 
to assume it's going to be different. You know, all we can really do is say it's going to operate in the same way, but on a different level, or you know, only so many variables we can to adjust on this. Um, again, we didn't study the driveway of the, the su southern driveway there onto Taylor Street. Um, so I can't say if that's going to be overloaded or not. I know that the traffic volume on Taylor Street is pretty small. Um, so uh, I would imagine that that can handle some volu volume turning left on it. You know, I, I can't say we didn't study the Route 2 or intersection or, you know, there's only so far that it goes. Right. Uh, well, I'm just I'm obviously building towards the idea of conditions that if there were conditions for signage to direct people, oh, you know, especially those turning left that would otherwise be heading for 89, particularly because we're talking about hotels, so we're almost, in, well, I think we have to expect a number of people who aren't oriented to the street map of Montpelier mm -hmm. um, and how we want to get them to, to even think about going out to to this traffic and whether it would make sense to make that a condition for some directional signage you know, from a traffic point of view, to put people, and, and whether it would make sense to put them in on Taylor Street. So for example, you know, people exiting the parking garage that are headed to St. Johnsbury, do we want them to turn left onto Taylor Street and then another left onto Memorial Drive and head out that way? You know, uh, is that worth doing, not St. Johnsbury itself, but, but I mean, that kind of directional signage, is that going to have a real impact on the traffic as opposed to putting them into State Street, putting them then into Main Street, into these very, these higher traffic areas when they're not really headed in that, mm -hmm. to that particular location? So the typical threshold for when you would evaluate that kind of thing is if the number of trips going through these intersections reaches a certain threshold. It's uh, from the Agency of Transportation's perspective, that's 70 trips. Um, and the two intersections that we did study didn't even meet that threshold, but you know, it's generally just something that you do to, to review how your project will, will go into that. Uh, so but, I mean, you're, you're talking, at least, it may, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, taking the, I think it was 51 onto State Street and, and adding another 41, so that whether or not that would cross that threshold. Um, so the existing North Drive uh, adds 66 trips. So that's under that 70 threshold. Um, it's kind of because it's separate into these two, two um, intersections. Um, so um, I, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure uh, what, what um, What's the question? <laughs> we lose third yeah. question. I think I might have followed. So I think that the trip generation, the 75 trip number is the additional trips, yeah, right? right? We're not the beyond that, that. Not the, you take those additional trips and add them to what are already there, right? So you have 60 some odd trips exiting onto State Street, you said, as new trips. Yeah. And then there's, again, less than 75 new trips at peak hours exiting onto Taylor Street at the current level, right? But not necessarily the 2025 level, or is that the 2025 level? Um, what, I was, what I was trying to say was that um, the, um, the amount of traffic that is kind of generated from this new proposed parking garage um, doesn't really follow or doesn't, doesn't meet the threshold for a lot of AOT um, traffic studies for like further analysis into like larger upstream or downstream intersections I, and I guess you know I, I, and my question well, I'm trying to dovetail it into that I, I, I think is really coming out of a sense of having walked in downtown Montpelier and on State Street where Elm Street dumps into State Street and then that next block into Main Street um, and East State Street where there is a lot of traffic and you're getting it from a lot of different sources so to the extent that we have something like this, a, a large project that's that's funneling a lot of parking, you know, to the extent that we can avoid adding that to that downtown intersection, it, whether or not we meet the AOT <coughs> threshold or not, it, I'm trying to, to just suss out whether that's 
a worthy goal to pursue through signage conditions, um, whether it would make sense to direct that traffic and, and also not shifting one problem, which is what I'm envisioning, onto Taylor Street that creates then a whole other set of problems of unanticipated consequences. Um, and to what extent, and maybe this is the, the larger question, which is what are your recommendations? And we're sort of moving into the internal traffic flow a little bit. Um, but what are your recommendations for how traffic should be entering and exiting? Should we be exercising any control over where cars are going or trying to get cars to go in certain ways, such as my hypothetical where somebody's headed out of town? We, we want them to go uh, Taylor Street if possible, um, as opposed to coming out onto State Street. Uh, absolutely. I'd say you want to direct them the, the clearest and most efficient route. Um, so I, I think that wayfinding would be an essential part of all that. Um, you know, I think that there's a, a, a lot of benefit to having the, the um, you know, having this garage in a place with some amount open to the public, that provides a place for people to know, to find parking that they know that, you know, they're going to have to pay for it, but there's going to be parking there. Um, especially if it's a, a big bank that might be open to the public for uh, whenever the, the uh, hotel's not using it there. Um, so rather than having people like hunting for parking throughout the city streets, they'll be coming to one centralized location. So I think that there's going to be a big benefit for that. Um, then the other, the other benefit um, would be uh, just uh, when you are directing people using this wayfinding, you know, they're not, you know, hopefully not getting lost <laughs> on their way uh, out, out of town or uh, to, the, to, their, to their destination. Um, you know, whether or not we send people down Taylor Street to get to, um, you know, St. Johnsbury, that direction. The route two, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, part of it, too, is, you know, the fighting, you know, when I go east, I always want to go east as mm -hmm. opposed to maybe more efficient for me to go mm -hmm. west and then back around. Um, but I think that's, I, I don't want to necessarily beat a dead horse. I think yeah. that's been very helpful, at least for my mind, <laughs> on the signage issue and the in direction. Um, any other questions on some of the traffic? I, I do want to ask a question, unless not hearing anyone else jump in. Um, internally, you know, there's been some talk about how traffic is going to flow through um, in, in a stop either stop signs or some type of traffic control at this four-way point. As part of your traffic recommendations, are you making any particular recommendation about the internal flow and circulation? This study didn't really look at traffic circulation. It's mostly just traffic generation. Um, you know, Dave does a great job with that kind of thing, so I'm sure he's given it a lot of thought. Okay. So, any, so yours is just largely surface uh, street. Mine is mostly just like parking ge or trip generation based on yep. the, the increase of parking um, and where those vehicles are kind of going and how that interacts with the existing intersections. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks. You're very welcome. We don't want to have to keep you running a bill either unless <laughs> um, I don't have any other questions on track. Okay. I don't know if there's going to be public questions that we would want answered or. I don't know. Mr. Whitaker, do you have any questions about the street I traffic? I my questions. Okay, then it, it may make sense. Just I'd I'm happy to stay okay. a little longer, it's, or it's, it's strictly up to you, or more importantly, it's strictly up to the people paying you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I know that there, there, you said that there's a follow-up meeting too. So I mean, we might be back and yeah. Well, ho yeah. hopefully your your coworker will be feeling better. But uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I'd I'd say just stay until this breaks up. Okay, yeah. I'm happy to. Well, and I'm just going to make note of time. It's it's 9:30. Um, I feel comfortable and rest rest of the board, depending on how you feel. I, I had coffee before I came, uh, of pushing through to 10 to try and get through this. Um, but I, I guess I'm a little bit leery of pressing too much further on. Um, I think we lose focus. And given that we do have another meeting, um, but again, I'm also, I can go, I can go to midnight. I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to do that, but I'm also conscious that other people can't. How's the board feeling? Are we ready? I'm, I'm done at 10. That sounds nice. Okay. Yes. 10. Okay. We're going to have another hearing anyway. We're exactly. We're not going to the evidence, so there's no reason to, to kill ourselves. But it would be good to get as much as we can done tonight. So, so Greg, we're going to let you rest your half hour filibuster away.
Okay, well, I, I think I think there, that uh, it may be useful to just turn our attention to some of the red letter comments in the uh, um, staff report, because uh, as we looked at some of these, I think um, uh, I think we've I think we've addressed them, and I just want to kind of go through those as kind of the, the pieces that need to be correct before we come back. Um, the, the, the first general red line comment is, is sort of a process one, and we've sort of covered that. It's, this will all have to somehow come together in the end. Uh, but starting on page five of the staff report at uh, under district standards and uh, sub paragraph B, um, this was the conversation about uh, frontage and um, and all of that. And I think I, th I think we've touched on that plenty tonight the 30 foot frontage at the uh, at the uh, access to the lot um, on page six there's a pile of red line comments uh, uh, again talking about frontage also talked about the setback along the river I'll get with Meredith on this in the in the interregnum but uh, um, we read the regs to say in this district that there's a 20 foot setback and that's what we've observed. That's, that's what we've put on the site plan. You seem to be indicating that, that it could be less, although I don't. So do people want me to discuss this right now? Sure. OK. So the reason that this came up is because we have this issue in UC1 where water setbacks are actually zero feet when you're dealing with channelized sections of river. Now, the only reason I went further into this, because there's no definition of what channelized means in the regulations, um, and we didn't have any, any testimony on this or, or evidence in the application, but um, I have been informed by the planning director that last year the directly opposite side of the North Branch was determined to be channelized by the board mm -hmm. in a decision on the 10, 12, and 16 Main Street parcel, which is all being changed as part of this one Taylor Street project, the Moat properties. So in theory, this directly opposite side may be channelized as well. Um, like I said, there's no definition of channelized, but in the prior decision, the board decided it was channelized based on testimony from an engineer that the river was physically controlled at its banks. That was what was quoted from the decision. So it was just something that I figured we needed to be aware of, that there was that possibility, mm -hmm. um, and whether or not the board even feels like it needs to dig deeper into this and ask for more evidence as to whether or not the current side of the river that we're dealing with is channelized or not or if because the site plan complies with the 20 foot setback, just leave it. But it was something I, I didn't feel like I could just leave out there in the ether since I was informed about it. So I can, I can maybe fill in a little bit more. That might be good since. On, on the board at the time. So there is a term about, you know, setbacks from the river and there is a term channelized. So normally it's 20 feet back from a river. Um, if it's a natural free uh, floating river. But obviously if you have, uh, you know, for example, in the Necky classroom building sits on the North Branch, zero feet back on top of granite and the river doesn't go anywhere but between the stones, walls. And so, you know, the question is, we were faced with a year ago was what does channelized mean? Does it mean strictly the sort of, you know, that, that sort of Amsterdam on the canal stone wall channel that's established? Or does it mean something where there's clear man-made boundaries that the river can't meander within that largely keep it within a channel? And at the time that the city made a determination, the, the, this board made a determination that the evidence was that at least on that side of the river, it was channelized because there was rock. There was, you know, very little that the river could do to move against that. Now, I think this is a fact-based determination, and I 
think the applicant would have to put forward evidence that it was not channelized, and they may not want to do that. They may be happy enough with their 20-foot setback. We have other constraints because of the geometry of the lots involved that would prevent us from meaningfully taking advantage of that. Um, the only exception I could think of would be if, if we were trying to get a ramp or something in that area, but we've already talked about how we're trying to avoid that. Um, so from the applicant's point of view, I would just say that we're not claiming a zero-foot setback, and so I, I think that renders the issue moot. Um, so, um, can I just ask one question on page six? Is um, <clears throat> how up, up top here uh, talking about how how high is this building? The, like the highest point on it. Um, well, it's labeled on the elevations, and that would probably be the stair tower adjacent to the uh, the hotel. Mm -hmm. um, so, notionally, it's it's. 10 foot uh, floor for four floors or 40 feet, but then we've got parapets and stuff. So I think, uh, uh, you know, I think, you know, for a small part of its footprint, it would probably be like 48 feet or something, but I, I just would have to, okay. I'd have to bring up the drawings again to look. But it is labeled on the drawings in your package. Okay, so the, the next comment on page seven is a housekeeping one, it's basically telling us to do our homework. Um, we've already, on page eight, there's a comment again about the uh, frontage requirement. I think we've covered that pretty handily. Um, the, at the bottom of page eight, there's uh, some discussion about uh, vegetation in the 20-foot setback. Um, so, I mean, for other reasons, we're, we're still, uh, we're still treating this as if it's not channelized and we plan on vegetating that area like crazy, so. When you say vegetating, you mean? Per the, per the landscape architect's earlier comments, there's going to be, uh, you know, river birches and wisteria and all the stuff that's on the planting schedule. Um, occupying that space. Um, I, the red line comments on, Arctic, on, on 9 are, are a little bit arcane, and I'm not going to drag you into it. it. It relates to erosion control stuff on steep slopes. Uh, as it works out that the uh, drop between the back of the Capitol Plaza and the Haney lot is a steep slope, but um, we're already planning on doing the required erosion control planning stuff as part of our state permitting. So for our, from our perspective, it's not a big ask to just provide that. that uh, the, and I think Dave's done the math and it's been explained to Meredith. But yeah, it, it, just, it needs to be on the record because it was explained to me after evidence. Right. So if Dave could maybe just talk so to the slopes issue, please. That out. So this, uh, the project will require authorization from the state of Vermont under the Construction Stormwater General Permit. Um, so we are fully have to do that, um, but we also offered to provide an erosion control plan as part of this application package uh, to be delivered to staff this week to basically just cross the T's and, and dot the I's if there is any issue in regards to how to deal with the specific wording within uh, the regulation. So we have, we have no issue either way. But the, the one concern, and this is just to to flesh it out is that if I'm looking at the, uh, the map, it looks like the boundary, and that would be that sort of uh, grassy area between the Haney lot yeah. and the, um, the back of what's now the Bashara lot, yes. the Capital Puzzle lot, is, is a steep slope greater than 30 percent? Is that? Actually, we, based on the topographical mapping, we provided staff what those particular numbers were. Okay. Very close to 30 percent, absolutely. So we have an odd feature in Montpelier zoning, which is called steep slopes, which has nothing to do with erosion, but has everything to do with a limited uh, restriction on development. Mm -hmm. um, and so if there is a steep slope of 30% or greater, technically the rules talk about, a strict interpretation of the rules talk about no disturbance whatsoever. Um, and so 
just understanding if we're talking about that that restriction or not. Now, I think there's another issue because this has arisen already in the context of the school application, and there's a, a statute, 4413, that talks about governmental uses, not um, under Title 24, uh, that this, this does not apply in, in such cases that would prevent uh, a public use. Um, and it would be helpful to have that fleshed out only because this is a it isn't, it sounds like an erosion provision, but it's not. It's just strictly a development uh, prescription. It was basically, I mean, other communities will adopt the same type of rules, and the intent is 30% slope on the side of the hill. We don't want you there because of, obviously, whether it be site or erosion issues or just inability to develop in an appropriate manner. Uh, here that we have basically a very narrow strip that happens to be man-made that ha often in other communities has also been you know basically they said if it's natural greater than 30 percent the intent of the rule was not to develop in that particular area but here in this particular case this was specifically man-made in order to basically maximize one particular parking lot adjacent to another so those are all things that other communities have used as outs if necessary I mean, right now, the numbers indicate that we're right at the 30% value, or just slightly under. Um, so taken at face value, it's a non-issue. But do appreciate your thoughts relative to Statute 4413 as far as what municipalities have as far as um, basically opportunities not to be reviewed under specific issues. I think I think on ten that's a continuation of this conversation. It gets more at the heart of what you what you were suggesting. Right. Um, uh, but if I'm not mistaken, isn't that slope twenty nine point seven percent? Right. And we do not have more than four thousand square feet of disturbed area. We have about fourteen hundred and ninety seven square feet. So we uh, we can come back with this in in a in a memo or a, I mean, we can put it on the plans. But it, it seems like we're below the threshold at the 25% slope, uh, and we fall just short of the 30% slope. Um, but you know, unless unless you have anything different you want to say about it, the, the item on number 10 is a continuation or sort of an expansion. Well, and, I'll, of and I'll say I, I, I certainly understand, um, and I think I agree. You know that when other other communities have promulgated such rules. They've clearly been clear in their intent for what those are. Um, you know, unfortunately, ours haven't developed that nuance yet. I mean, I think there's ways, and, um, you know, we'll certainly look carefully at it. The more help you can give us, um, the, the better, because it is, you know, a function of our, of our bylaws as they're written right now. Um, and they do not make that nuanced distinction between what I would agree the purpose of such provisions are um, as opposed to this small man-made right but what it, based on what I know now we walk up to but we don't cross the threshold and I mean we can way between now and the next time we see it we, we can obviously do some kind of demonstration to explain why we feel why why sure. we reach that conclusion but the other thing that becomes a dilemma for the board is we a project may design a slope to be a three-on-one, which is considered to be a stable slope, but a three-on-one slope is 33%. Are you saying you can never come back and redevelop your lawn that was sloped off at three-on-one? That's the way it's written. And yeah. that's what yep, we're starting with. Well, and, and, I guess and we know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I, I, the board's not insensitive to that fact, is that that doesn't make a certain amount of logical sense. Um, yep. and to the extent that we have the rules we have. Um. Oh, it's, it's, it's a great rule for what I think it was meant for, which is to preserve the sort of hills around the city and, and not turn this into Los Angeles. But um, I, I, th I think we're going to rely on, on looking at the mapping yep. and, and just seeing, seeing if we can't fall within the regs. Uh, 
We'll just have no, to see that how it makes it. That makes it easy. I just want to flag that for you because that is an issue that we've been wrestling with as a board. Okay. Um, that 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 slope isn't one consistent thing over there. It's got footpaths all over it and stuff. That's kind of what complicates it. But um, DPW uh, had comments on page 11, and we've been we've been talking about. Uh, um, Agree various agreements between parties and stuff, and I think this all gets swept up into that, as well as our ongoing dialogue with with DPW on a semi daily basis. I think we, we, there's been a lot of communication there, but the, at the top of page 11, it's talking about uh, do we have to have permission from any of our neighbors or any of that stuff, and we'll come back with that. Okay. Um, Again, I think uh, 12 is a conversation we had earlier today, which uh, at the top of page 12 is a discussion about how far apart the driveways are supposed to be. I think this is in the, the staff comments because we're going to be asking you to grant us a, a waiver of that or use whatever discretionary power you have to, to waive that away. Um, also, on page 12, towards the middle, is talking about the master agreement, which I think Bill uh, William Frazier laid out for you earlier this evening. Right. Uh, we talked about the traffic study. I, I, I think uh, it's a red line comment here because stuff was going back and forth right up until the day of the hearing. Um, uh, the the uh, number of accessible parking spaces in the parking garage. Uh, that's a labeling issue. I think that they're shown in the in the plans. You can see where the offloading areas are. They just need to have that handicap symbol on them or the accessible parking symbol put on them. Um, but but we we do have the right number. They just need to be properly labeled. Um, snow storage is a conversation that we've had on a number of occasions. Um, there are there are two halves to this. The conversation related to the garage part snow is going to be melted rather than stored. Okay. Um, we had recommended a, a, mo a mobile piece of equipment to do that, um, but I think DPW wants us to explore the use of uh, district heat to uh, basically put snow melt on the exposed part of the garage. And, um, we're going to look at the technicalities of that, um, but in any case, I think snow from the parking garage is going to be melted. And, and when you, um, when we're talking about snow removal, we're really just talking about the top floor. Yes. Yeah, pretty much. I, in our experience, the intermediate levels are not going to have a significant amount of snow on them. Um, and, and so this would be, you're not pursuing any thoughts about dumping the snow like they do at National Life where they open up the gates and they just push it <laughs> over the side. Uh, to, yeah. to have it drop four stories? I, well, I mean, the thing is, is, is um, yeah, I mean, apart from the, 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 the hazard that might cause, uh, I, you know, um, when it gets to the bottom, it's got to be piled up somehow. Sure. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not proposing you do this. I'm, I'm just saying, <laughs> clarifying what? that you're not going yeah. down that road. <laughs> I am not doing that. No. <laughs> and and uh, you know what happens today on that big lot is it gets shoveled into trucks and then it gets hauled to another part of town where it gets put in big piles, mm -hmm. you know, under the bridge. Um, so we feel like this uh, that's pretty inefficient. It's putting additional trucks out onto the street at the worst time of year when try, you know. Traffic is competing with piles of snow. Um, yeah, so our recommendation is for the garage is to melt it. We did on the original approval for the hotel have a couple of designated places to pile up snow, and that will stay unchanged from the original application. If I'm remembering correctly, those were mainly for the surface area, not the garage. They itself. were they were for the surface area, yes. But now that we've done this subdivision, that's the whole of it for the for the hotel, right? Um, yeah, and I I, I I expect that uh, um, we'll have to do a little more work with the city to sort of figure out really how effective that the heating system could be. But uh, we're going to explore that to the, to rule it in or out. Okay. 
How about the electronic or the electric uh, charging stations for cars? Is that being included as well? That is being included. In fact, if I didn't notice in the new ordinances, isn't there a requirement for that? But so I believe I calculated we would need 20 uh, electrical vehicle charging stations. I reached out to a vendor to get us cut sheets and uh, and uh, come up with a power plan for those. Uh, and unfortunately, it wasn't available for tonight. But hopefully, we can fold that into the application being made this week. Um, we are also making sure the garage is solar ready. What about the idea uh, Mr. Whitaker brought up uh, about the backup generator um, for some of these services? Or well. Um, Generation is one way to do it. I think, you know, for the equipment that runs the garage, the, uh, the computer systems and the like that, that, you know, will have a small server closet, um, we would probably rather go with a UPS type situation, a, 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 a basically a battery backup mm -hmm. for that equipment. Um, but I don't see us putting a large scale generator in this project. Um, we don't, our power demands aren't that great. Um, whether or not it's a Tesla power wall or some variation on that, we got to run underground. I mean, power needs are going to be for the 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 lighting system, the uh, right. the gate system. Yep. Um, but it sounds like this, what the, the elevators, elevators as well. I mean, could that be run off of a? But there'll be a stairwell as, as there are stairwells, um, and the, the entirety of the garage is accessible. I mean, a, a person in a wheelchair is not going to encounter excessive slopes if they had to if they had to just wheel their way back down. I'm thinking in flood surface conditions that the elevator might be shut off. Yeah. So that's the reality of that. Yeah. So there's that. But what about just general power outage with somebody in the elevator? During a general oh, power outage. Uh, I don't know. I haven't. I haven't. I haven't sorted that out yet. I'll go find information about that and come back to you. I mean, that, that, that's probably there. Are probably issues I mean, it's for any building that has an elevator. What what kind of backup? Uh, it, it's not a matter of building code or Vermont state state law. It it, it comes up for us uh, most typically as a requirement of the franchise organization. Like Hilton will require the elevator in the hotel to have a backup. Right. Um, but uh, well, I mean, thinking from the elevator installation people, I'm sure they face this issue and what. It's just a big electric motor. It's they're yeah. really big electric motors, and providing backup for something like that is a pretty substantial investment. Um, as far as the lighting goes, it's all LED lighting. Uh, we're trying to work with our solar vendor to made up the power demand of the, the lighting circuits with the output capacity of the uh, of, of the solar array. Um, so, you know, that that will have some kind of back, battery backup system on it as well. At a minimum, it'll be the battery ballasts and the individual light fixtures to come on if they lose power for. It'll last for a short period of time. Right. Uh, but if if we if the city does pull the trigger on installing solar on this, then then, then that would be incorporated into that design. Um, uh, we didn't get uh, a chance. We ran out of time today to talk uh, with the AC to talk about fences, um, but there will be a fence along the railroad right away. We want it to. Um, is and that something the DRC is re reviewing as it, well? They sh they, it's, uh, it's their purview. Per that's what I was and say, retaining yeah. walls as well, which we didn't get to today, but we do have a retaining wall system that we need approval for. Um, but just in terms of ticking off the red letter, letter items, sure. um, at the bottom of 15, there's discussion about landscaping. That uh, came up earlier today. Uh, it'll come up here. Um, your ordinance requires a certain number of trees and shrubs. Uh, uh, Meredith had calculated 22 trees and 129 shrubs. I think she's she's looking for guidance. We're looking for the board to agree that the vines and stuff that we plan on a growing wall count as shrubs. And I don't know if they do. I mean, shrubs have a particular definition, but 
we, we've interpreted that provision within the context of that section, and there's actually very good language along the lines of what Dave was talking about with other s steep slope regulations, which I think allow us to modify that requirement within the context of the purpose that's stated fairly clearly, which is screening and to provide some break and, and, and to can ensure that there's natural resources at the site, but um, not to obscure the site itself. And certainly if you're planting a bunch of river birches, I think those would count towards any uh, total as well. So, I mean, I think there's ways to, to look at that um, based on the needs, and Meredith can certainly give you guidance on that. We're, we're very close to having the right numbers. If, if we can find a way to look at it like that, I mean, my problem is, is I was going to spend a lot of money on those. I don't have a whole lot of real estate left to plant shrubs. I mean, we could do it, but it starts to get silly. Sure. I mean, we, we just dealt with the clothespin factory that's completely paved. Um, so finding a place for 40 trees is even more difficult. <laughs> that's that. Okay. Um, at any rate, that's uh, that's an issue of substance we'll have to talk of as we look at the site plan review for the garage. Um, and a similar comment on page 16 relating to some trees planted on the north side of the garage. Um, so because, because of this conundrum, Meredith wasn't sure that as proposed it met the minimum planting requirements. And it really comes down to that issue. And so sense of the board is yes we can probably figure our way through this is one thing if the answer is absolutely not come back with a landscape plan showing us 60 shrubs you know no, we'll I, I mean I would commend you to the language surrounding that particular subsection G um, that talks about the purpose of these plantings for screening effect um, we've cited them in our prior decisions on this, this particular and, and you know, a strict application of subsection G can lead to irrational results if it's not put into the context of the site and the purpose of these plantings. So that's what we've, and so the more you can point us to, and especially since you have a landscape designer who can, you know, talk to those particular features, that's, that's important and that helps us. Okay. Especially explaining why, you know, it's either impractical, impossible, or would actually go against the stated purposes of the statute to include an additional 140 shrubs or whatever. Well, just as, just this, we're not omitting plant material. Sure. We're just we're looking for for flexibility in, in what shape. I mean, as an example, another applicant was able to show that they had a large specimen size tree in their front yard, and to plant other trees around it would in approach that and cause damage to both the existing large tree as well as, you know, the planted trees, and so it made no sense. Um, so those kind of, you know, seeing your landscape architect nod his head, so. Um, I, I anticipate that a permit, if issued, will include a condition that the landscape materials have to be maintained. If they die, they get yes. replaced. Uh, just anticipating a, a public comment on that, but we expect they'll have to be maintenance plans in place. Um, Chief of Police uh, chimes in on, on page 11 uh, at number 2 and under D, and he uh, basically goes over the, where they want lighting and cameras. Um, and uh, it's in keeping with what we talked about earlier this evening. And uh, to clarify what outdoor lighting will be provided, uh, I, I do have lighting plans for the whole site and lighting plans for the interior of the garage as well, uh, which were reviewed with the uh, Design Advisory Committee. If, if anybody here wants information about any of that, I'd be happy to show you. Um, but we'll just make sure it's included in your packages for, for the next. I did get some of the, uh, I think some of the cut sheets. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there was some concern because you got the cut sheets for the, gu the guts of the garage. You had gotten three of them, but there were like five or six more for the site lighting. Okay. 
Yeah, so there's there's some additional stuff that he presented at design review uh, as part of his presentation that we'll just make sure is incorporated before the next hearing into updated packages with updated staff reports. And, and it's all a continuation of what was previously approved and what's currently being used, I understand, as a sort of design standard in downtown. Right. Sort of a uh, gaslight looking street lamps and, uh, and just you know, wall mounted security lighting. Um, so I think with that, that takes me to page 18. Those are the red line comments. We, uh, at Design Advisory, we, we were challenged to look at a couple of areas of the design of the building, but it, it hasn't changed substantially from what you saw previously, which um, I think the one change we made that, that uh, was a request perhaps from this board or the city council was that the tops of the stairwells have a new roof design. So showing a curved roof. We didn't talk much about the buildings tonight, um, but but the, the size shape of it, you know, the basic material patterns are there. If, we, if you want to spend any time talking about that, but it's after it, ten. It's after ten, and I think it would make more sense after you finalized it with develop a design review. Yeah. Um, Which hopefully that way you're not proposing. Week. And I, I see you brought. Well, I would love to touch and feel the bricks. Um, <laughs> I think it may make more sense after those are finalized with the design review. They take obviously a more intensive cut at it yeah. than we're going to. Um, I had one question that, that I didn't want to forget, um, and it, it deals with the internal circulation. And it's, it's really a question of the threat of, you know, the, right now that, that parking lot is an infamous cut for, for people. Um, my concern is that, you know, is there is there a risk of that continuing, especially once you get rid of those speed bumps straighten out the roads? Um, and are there countermeasures to, to, to discourage people from using that as a cut through to the intersection? Are you talking about people in cars? In cars, yes. I'm out, I, so, I don't think we'll care necessarily. So people, people who want to get over to Taylor Street Bridge but don't want to go through Taylor Street Light and they, it, or the exactly. stop sign in Enid and Or vice versa. Um. Um, you know, I don't have a solid answer for that. I'm just reacting off the top of my head. I guess I guess we can talk about what kind of internal directional signage and stuff we can use to try to discourage that. But, I mean, if it becomes a sort of quasi-city street, people, people may use it. Yeah. To me, it feels a little bit like cutting through the corner station, the gas station parking lot. And, you right. know, cutting the corner and skipping the light, but uh, without a light, it doesn't. I don't. It's like, do you think the it would be easier to turn left at that spot versus turning left a few hundred feet down the road at Taylor Street? I no, I don't if, think it would be uh, much of a difference than in the behavior you're currently seeing now. Um, if you formalize the whole roadway network system there, and I don't, I'm not exactly sure what the internal um, traffic control is, if it's like a four-way stop or what, but if there's like a stop sign there and they know that there's like traffic coming out of the, the garage that they might have to contend with, it might discourage that kind of thing. So until you until you see it, um, you know, it's hard to, to see how people are going to use it. So that'll all go back to that internal circulation four-way stop component review to again try to address that concern as well as just what's practical at that particular intersection of all the different land vehicular uses of the area so i think that's the opportunity that we have as far as the traffic the signage plan um, and i think that needs to be reviewed sooner than later so right. we're at this point in time putting together a, at least a traffic management signage plan uh, that will help um, at least provide a clearer picture as far as how we would be guiding people and managing people moving through this particular property. And a well-engineered site will, will um, not necessarily keep that from happening, but at least control it. So it'll be a slower environment, a safer environment. Right. And especially now, it's probably a free-for-all out there. So um, especially if there's not a bunch of cars parked there. But with curbs kind of directing people into a specific path, um, you know, the, the textured pavement or, or whatever treatments in front of the, the proposed hotel, you know, it'll be a different environment. Right. I mean, I've, I've just, and this is total anecdotal, but, I've, you know, I've seen if somebody's three cars are taking a left on Taylor Street, someone jog back behind 
the hotel to get onto State Street. Mm -hmm. um, but it, again, I, I, I appreciate it. It may not be something you can control, or you can stop, but you can control. So, okay. Any other questions? I was just wondering tonight? as far as timing goes, and it looks like there's items still to collect to get the input of the design review. So we're going to, yeah, and I think, and I feel it's only fair to give uh, Mr. Whitaker uh, <coughs> five minutes to, to make his comments that he wants to make. And then uh, what I would propose to the board, unless we're feeling differently, is to uh, continue this to the next, our next regularly scheduled meeting, which is today's the 15th, November, uh, November 5th. Um, where we would we would take all we would continue all three until then they wouldn't have to be rewarned. The evidence is still open. That gives an opportunity for DRC to complete their review and bring that material along as well as some of the other sort of holes that that you know we, we touched upon tonight. Does that makes sense. May I just make a slight addition to that? Sure. Uh, if we could, if everybody here agrees to have a deadline for materials from the applicant of the end of day this Friday the 19th so that there is a two-week window for the public to review those materials. There might be some discussion from the design review committee continuation hearing, which is probably going to be next week. Some of those things might have to get folded in, but other than that, to have that be the deadline for new items from the applicant. Is that something you can live with? Is that uh, Meredith already uh, made that shot across the bow a while back. So okay. we've been all pointing in that direction. Okay. And I think I think we'll handle the DAC stuff by just having both or any alternatives yeah. in the package. Okay. I mean, so they'll sounds be picking good. from one of them. Yeah. I, I mean, Ryan makes a, oh, a good point, um, <laughs> which is I don't know if we can legally require that. Um, which is if the applicant shows up, he shows up with, with his material. But obviously... If we can try at the... Can, at, at, suggest the let's suggest but, that. You know, this and is that something... If, that if, and certainly, you know, if, uh, if the applicant shows up with a bunch of new stuff that they have the public hearing and the public has... This is the first opportunity they're seeing, we're much less likely to close the evidence and say we've got a full picture. Right. So if you want us to be able to reach a decision sooner, it behooves you to have that out there to the public in advance so that everybody comes having reviewed it. So can I make a clarification then? This Friday would be the drop dead deadline for getting things and submitting them to the d Department of Planning for my staff report and for public so that we're not so that the public isn't going oh wait but you added something two days later but that the applicant just like they did tonight has the ability to bring additional information to the hearing Yeah. that can then Perfect. be added in. I so we don't have a running Sure. Every two days something new comes in, but we have a window, and then, yeah. does that work? That yeah. sounds great to me. Okay. Which I would hope at this point you're starting to narrow. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 the only sand in our gears is that we're, talking, we're reaching out to third parties to collect stuff, you know. Yeah. And that's, that's been what's sort of been the drag on this, is, is getting input from various state people, all of that. So This is, an interesting, this is a fairly complicated project that you're yeah. putting together. You know, short amount of time. So, I mean, the fact that we've found this far, I think is, uh, you know, certainly the professionalism involved has been um, high caliber. Um, so it's, I think it's more just simply because we're dealing with a public notice and we're dealing with a yep. public process to be as complete, as early as possible, and as, um, uh, you know, the fewer sort of contradictory pieces of information, the easier it is for people to understand. And yeah. the less you have, um, you know, counter counter narratives going um, as to confu confusion over what was and what is. Okay. So, Mr. Whitaker, you had some comments. I do. Uh, I will not speak to this, but I'll enter it. It's what I gave the designer. It, it's from the 2000 plan, master plan on the preservation of the River Greenway. Etc. It should guide your uh, deliberations. Um, the I, I believe fundamentally that the traffic 
what you've heard tonight and seen is a, a kind of a cumulative agglomeration of various trip generation estimates. But some of the questioning has also revealed that you do not have a traffic impacts analysis of this project, and especially you don't have a traffic impacts analysis of three projects, of three under construction projects at once, two of which are going to significantly displace existing surface parking. Haney lot parking is going to be displaced, Capitol Plaza lot parking is going to be displaced, and the transit center lot has already been displaced. But to have the construction, the ex excavation of hundreds if not thousands of cubic yards of uh, soil and asphalt to be removed from the Capitol Plaza lot to bring it down to the Haney lot, those dump trucks, those excavators, those workers, those are not factored in here. You are actually wrestling with uh, gridlocking Montpelier for the next year in this decision. But more importantly, the, I guess I'll cut to the chase and say you need to hire. this. You've in effect inherited Mr. Bashara's traffic consultant, who now has become the city's traffic consultant, who admits that we've not done uh, circulation analysis. So you really need to order your own traffic study traffic impacts analysis, new guidance out from VTRANS dated September 2018, and I had it copied and was many, meant to enter it in. If, with the board's permission, I will email it to Meredith and ask you to take administrative notice of it. I've also spoken to a traffic analyst who does this kind of work on behalf of communities, and he has seen and reviewed much of this, and he uh, has some thoughts. I, I had printed that letter and meant to end it, but the copy shop failed to include it in my package. I will send that. Uh, Michael Oman is working for Heinsberg, has worked on several projects. Uh, but Du Bois and King did, for the transit center, do a more thorough transit traffic impact circulation analysis. Interestingly, the, two, the bus circulation analysis is still in draft form dated 2017. And yet, it's being relied on as a finished product in the recommendations you've just received. So my point is that the DPW memo saying that it's all wonderful is hooey. And that you really need to look at what you heard tonight and order your own traffic analysis. Similarly, at the last meeting, there was discussion about doing a balloon validation with by independent observers of this because a 25-foot bridge does not, they, these poles are 40 feet. Those, these poles are lower than the garage. So this garage rendering is dramatically underrepresenting the garage, and yet the architect is refusing to release the 3D models so that an independent analysis can be done. Those are, in my opinion, work made for hire, paid for by the city, and we've got a public records issue which might delay approval of this project. That's a civil issue, not for this board. Uh, I'm going to take exception to that comment. He thinks he owns the work that we've paid for. Well, I mean, yeah, no, public records are, I mean. My point is, if I understand your, your point okay. about the information. We, we need to do view shed analysis from various perspectives, and we can't rely on the work that they've produced. Uh, he's, he's alleging that we've somehow falsified our application. This is my comment, period. I'm right. sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Phil, I noticed you used the word filibuster. <laughs> so, go ahead. I'm going to try to wrap it up. Um, conditions are not remediation. Condition, you know, what are the consequences to misrepresenting or poorly uh, offering uh, incomplete due diligence? The garage gets built, and we suffer the consequences for the next three or four decades. Uh, you know, signage saying no through traffic is not going to solve the problem that you're. Uh, alluded to. We've got multiple projects. We've got s existing traffic which hasn't been measured from the North Field Savings Bank, salons, Capitol Plaza offices, Capitol Plaza rooms, church, the new hotel, short-term city parking, and we've got 38 new flexible parking spaces for the city. This, this project is uh, being rushed through. You're being encouraged to in fact, potentially vote to approve it the day before a vote 
on their ten and a half million dollar bond, that's just totally untenable. This this is not the way to spend the public's money or to make informed public decisions with such long lasting consequences. Uh, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So I'd entertain a motion uh, from the from the board to continue this if that was the consensus uh, of the three applications to the next meeting. Yes, yeah, so move to continue all three until uh, next meeting with the uh, pending additional information from the applicants as discussed tonight. We submitted to Meredith, uh, hopefully, as hope would be by the uh, end of uh, October 19th. Okay. Push by Tom. Do I have a second? Second that. Second by Rob. Any further discussion from the board? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. All right, so we'll continue on November 5th. Um, and obviously the record is still open, so applicants, interested parties are free to submit additional information. You've heard the warning from staff, which is the person you should always make happy in any of these processes. <laughs> um, and we'll see you all in two weeks. And that's actually the only thing we have on the agenda next week. We knew this was likely to happen, so we've kept it open. So hopefully we won't be here till quarter after 10. But I appreciate everyone's professionalism and civility uh, in this process. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, move to adjourn. OK. Um, just before the, well, go ahead. Uh, just the other business, our next regularly scheduled meeting is Monday, November 5th, 2018, 7 p.m. I'll now take that motion from Tom to adjourn. Seconded by Ryan. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.